Yes, here we are. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. If you have uh, your camera on, love to see everyone's faces just so that I could uh, gauge some reactions and we could interact throughout this all. Welcome. Um, hope it was easy to sign up. This is my first master class. We'll wait for a couple more people to join in and then uh, we could officially get started. But does the audio sound good? We're rolling. Excellent. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, 33 people signed up. My name is Ryan Svensson. Uh, great to connect with you all. So I teach a course at UCLA Extension. It's a 11-week course, and I started thinking, you know, I really would love to start branching out a little bit more from that and give people the opportunity to connect ultimately because um, growing up playing the trumpet, I attended a ton of master classes. And if you've never attended one, it's essentially you're allowed to interact with someone, try out some ideas, uh, get feedback from them. Usually with trumpet master classes, you get to perform for the other person and then they critique you and give some best practices and feedback, but there's other people in the room and they all learn from what they're learning and what level they are at. And especially in the music industry right now, there's not a forum out there like this where we could all be in a room together learning from different levels and different skill sets and different approaches. Um, so I really wanted to start by making a place where that could happen and we could all learn from where we're at, where we're going, what we want to achieve, and uh, some best practices on the way so that we could get there quicker, right? I mean, the music industry is all about navigating experiences, making connections, learning as we move forward, and uh, the technology of music is always evolving first and foremost. Um, I don't know about you, but back in the day, having Napster, having LimeWire, audio files were the first to be transferred in and ripped off, right? You had all these bands like Metallica upset that their music was being downloaded without their permission and shared. And the sole reason it was music was because it was a smaller audio file and it was able to be shared easier than other files. So uh, as technology advances, we're now seeing the movie industry uh, being able to be shared and that's why uh, streaming was adapted so well and uh, now accounts for pretty much everyone having an account on a DSP like Spotify or iTunes or Netflix or whatever it might be to, so that we could consume as fast as possible and as quick as possible and still never be satisfied with all the options as we have out there, right? Um, so uh, we have a really great lineup today. Jennifer Pikin is gonna be joining us and um, Let's, let's just go ahead and start diving and, and get started. And if you have any questions along the way, feel free to raise your hand, uh, unmute yourself, and uh, we could interact with each other. So um, welcome. Uh, this is, like I said, the very first masterclass that I am hosting. Um, one of the ways that I really excelled in the music industry was taking courses, networking, and going to panels and other industry mixers to really broaden my horizons in the industry. So pat on the back to all of you for being here first and foremost. And I hope everyone puts their uh, contact info, uh, whether it be your socials, uh, whatever level that you're comfortable with in the chat so that you could share with everyone and everyone can be connected at the end of this as well. Um, the format of this, what I'd love to do is first and foremost, talk a little bit about my background and what I do currently at Millennium Media, because one of the most important things to dive into the mind of a music supervisor is to know what they do, what they specialize in, and what their forte is. And um, just to by a show of hands so I could read the room a little bit better, who in here is a music maker, an artist? Great. And who is more on the publishing side or in some capacity in the music industry? Great. Um, good mix there. So I'm going to be giving this presentation from the standpoint of a music supervisor and thinking in the mindset of a music maker as well so that both sides could really play off each other because in order to really know what a buyer wants, you got to know what the seller wants and vice versa. Um, 
we're going to talk about a couple of the productions I've been involved in, um, go into the mind of a music supervisor, as I was saying, uh, talk a little bit about the sync process and things to keep in mind as a music supervisor, as a music creator, and as a music owner. Um, because regardless of whatever side you are on, you got to know about the other in order to really excel in this uh, sync world. So our guest speaker is Jennifer Pikin, as I mentioned earlier. Can't wait to interview her. And if you have any questions on deck or that you want to think of now and ask her, make sure to brainstorm some of those because we are at your disposal this evening. And then at, towards the end, I wanted to do some one-on-one -on -one sessions. So this again is whoever wants to come to this stage, we could interact, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're at, and then kind of dive into whatever your aspirations are. If you're in a current situation in the music industry that you need advice on, if you're working on something, if, or if you simply want to play something for the room to hear, to get feedback on, that will be your opportunity to do so. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, first and foremost, I just wanted to talk about some highlights that over the past couple of years at Millennium Media that I've been a part of. Um, as soon as I joined the company, I realized our back end catalog uh, didn't have an admin or a publisher attached to it. So uh, I immediately uh, started to put feelers out there and we ended up inking a deal with Cobalt to administer and co-publish our back catalog for all of our music. Um, for those of you that are unfamiliar, when a composer joins a production, like a film or a TV or whatever it might be, the studio retains the publishing for all of their work. And that publishing um, is able to be um, basically uh, utilized in a variety of forms and collected upon, and it could even go for other sync opportunities. So studios like Universal, studios like Warner Brothers, they, some, they have 100 years worth of music, and this music could have a lot of different big hits on it, like um, the theme for Jaws or Star Wars, and um, collecting those royalties based on where these films or TV shows or whatever uh, perform are really important, and these companies really specialize in doing that. Um, as soon as I joined Millennium, uh, we were finishing up a film called The Outpost, and this came out in 2020. It was a little bit of a tricky situation because the pandemic just started, and a lot of studios withheld from releasing materials because they wouldn't be able to get as much theatrical attendance uh, as all the theaters were shut down. So we really uh, pivoted on this one and Screen Media released this film on uh, day and date, which means that the day it came out, it was also on demand and you were able to watch it. And I think a lot of people were craving content during the pandemic. And so a lot of people ended up watching this film, which is great. It's on Netflix now, if you'd be interested in watching it. Um, this um, film required an end title song, an original one, which we were able to put together. Uh, the director wrote the lyrics for it, and it meant a lot to him. And Rita Wilson uh, was the artist that sang it. Uh, it plays at the end of the film while a montage of the fallen soldiers are shown uh, as next to the actors that portrayed them. So um, really, really emotional song. We, I made a lyric video for it as well, which is up on YouTube. And it allows you to rewatch just that clip and kind of feel connected to the film again. And uh, the YouTube comments are really great on that as well because it's really people talking about how they felt after watching the film. And uh, this is why visual media is so important in our industry is because it allows people to experience things that they otherwise wouldn't, right? And to dream and to escape for a little bit. And, that, and when you take something of importance like a song and pair it with really emotional uh, scenes from of visual media, it creates uh, what you hope for to be cultural impacts or, or things that people share and talk about and revisit. And I think that we all here have probably seen films multiple times that we really enjoy, right? And we want to experience and relive. And that's why soundtracks are so important as well, because it allows us to experience it without having to watch it. So you could be listening to it in the car, singing along, wherever. Uh, another film that I worked on Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard, which I got to music supervise. This film 
is a little all over the place because it has a little bit of comedy, a little bit of action, thriller, and a little bit of romance. Uh, so I had a lot of fun with the needle drops in this one. Had to, uh, got to be able to put in a Tina Turner song in there uh, and a couple other really fun uh, spots in the film throughout. Um, another film that we did was Jolt, uh, which became an Amazon Prime original. Uh, Tesla. Uh, this is a period piece, but uh, the director actually wanted to use some modern music in it as well, which was a little different, kind of like Quentin Tarantino and how he always uses modern music, even though it might be a period piece, like J Django Unchained or some of his other films. Uh, another film called Till Death with Megan Fox, which was a thriller suspense film that is on Netflix right now as well. The Protégé, um, the Offering, which is a horror film um, that was scored by Christopher Young, who is a legend in the scoring world for horror films. The Enforcer with Antonio Banderas. And right now in theaters, Expendables 4. Um, has anyone here seen Expendables 4 yet? But you will. That was a trick question. Uh, so some, some good spots in there. There's actually 10 spots of music. And uh, the score was done by Guillaume Roussel, a uh, fantastic composer. So some upcoming productions that I'm currently working on, uh, we're in post on, uh, is The Bricklayer with Aaron Eckhart. I'm really excited about that one because the main character listens to jazz. So I was actually able to license one of my favorite jazz artists of all time. Guns Up with Kevin James. The Piper, which is about an orchestra that becomes possessed through its own melody. This was a huge undertaking as a music supervisor because there was a 60-piece orchestra on stage. You, Similar to a musical, you have to come up with the music prior to filming. Otherwise, no one on stage knows what to play or to sing or anything like that. Um, so I'm really excited for that one. Subservience, which is a thriller starring Megan Fox. Wanted Man starring Dolph Lundgren, also directed by Dolph Lundgren. Uh, Red Sonja, which is the reboot of the Marvel comic and the 80s film. Uh, giving it a facelift, and it's a really uh, going to be a great one. And uh, the another reboot of Hellboy, uh, called Crooked Man, and then another film of ours called Dirty Angels. So be on the lookout for these. Um, I will keep everyone posted as these get some release dates. So you might be wondering why Sync. Um, first off, I wanted to just share that my experience in this side of the industry has been fantastic. Uh, I've had the fortune of working at a record label. I've worked at a talent agency. I've worked in music management. And now on the studio side, um, Sync kind of blends all those together. But it's also some of the most supportive and engaging and helpful people. Um, everyone just seems to have a willingness to learn. And everyone also provides advice and feedback. And that primarily happens through the Guild of Music Supervisors. Uh, is anyone here a member of the Guild of Music Supervisors already? Got a couple members. Awesome. Uh, Jeremiah, I see you. How you doing? Good to see you. Um, so the Guild of Music Supervisors is a fantastic organization composed of uh, publishers, libraries, labels, studios, PROs like ASCAP and BMI and CSAC. And they have an award ceremony each year, but they also have um, the State of Music and Media Conference, which is a bunch of little um, breakout sessions where panels will be hosted. Uh, you also get on their mailing list and you can learn more about the sync industry. And in order to be in sync and to really be a part of it, uh, I'd say it's mandatory to be part of this organization. So if you haven't, check it out. It's fantastic, and I highly recommend it. Um, now, Sync, I always say, is a supplemental tool for an artist to make more money and to exploit their music more. What's really interesting is that 10,000 artists make over $100,000 on Spotify. Now, you might be wondering how many artists there are on Spotify. There's 11 million artists on Spotify. That is 0.09% of artists making above 100K a year. If you told me a plane had a 0.09% chance of surviving a flight, would I get on that plane? Would you get on that plane? No. But 
the pursuit of being an artist is greater than the risk that it takes to get there. And so that's why I want to be real with these statistics, but also share that you probably aren't going to be in that top 0.09% um, unless you make some hit songs and you, and you have that perfect marketing plan and publicity and you are affiliated with an artist. Um, only 25% are self-distributed of that 10,000. So, um, you know, a lot of people might complain about the labels or say, oh, you sold out, but it just shows their power and how capable they are of making an artist from ordinary to extraordinary. So don't ever doubt the power of a label and what they can provide for your services. Um, I know a lot of people complain, oh, they might take a large advance or you don't own your masters right away. Well, there has to be a little bit of a trade, right? And and them providing for uh, all the power that they could put behind you to get you onto the charts and into stardom. So uh, this is a really interesting statistic. Sync makes up 2.4% of the global music industry revenue. So as a whole, the music industry makes around $26 billion a year. Um, you might wonder what takes up a majority of that $26 billion. Well, it's subscription accounts, streaming. It takes up 48% with $12 billion. So all the streamers are racking in that money through ad revenue, through streams. And Sync is a $628 million industry. So all these artists are trying to get a sliver of that, whether it's through placements, whether it's through the revenue from the placements, uh, but the great news is it's up 22% from 2021. Now, in the next couple of years, we might see it go down a little bit because of the strike, because of the stoppage of production, similar to what we saw with COVID. But the good news is at any given time, there's around 650 productions always going on. And all these productions need music, right? Has anyone here seen a production as of late that doesn't have music? I haven't. Music is essential for all of these. So being the backbone for it in some form or fashion is achievable. And, you know, you might not be receiving the most amount of money uh, through a sync placement when you first start off, but you will see other great things happen because of it. Um, one is that it's added to your resume. Uh, you'll receive uh, residuals. You'll get a great hopefully upfront fee and the notoriety as well to be associated with a body of work that is larger than you could really help propel you as well into a, a different uh, trajectory or a different avenue. Um, so a couple thoughts that I just wanted to share as well before we start to dive in a little bit more is that you need to think about how many people want what you want. On the music supervision side, this can mean a variety of things. Are you wanting to be a music supervisor that specializes in feature film? Do you want to go down the TV route? Do you want to specialize in documentaries? There's all these little subsects of the industry that you could be, you know, excel in. And a lot of people think that they could do everything or they want to do everything, but that ends up being their biggest problem is that they didn't focus on a specific thing and get known for it. And I think especially within sync, you need to do that. Now, as a music maker, what, what is equivalent to that? I would say it's your genre. It's your sound. Are you bringing a modern sound to these productions? Are you specializing in a certain genre such as um, EDM, country, rock, rap, jazz, whatever it might be? And what is the market's demand for it? And what shows specialize in those genres? Has anyone here been watching Selling Sunset? A little bit. Okay, well, their sync is pretty funny because it's really energetic. It's always between scene transitions. And it's like, I woke up this morning, brushed my hair, feeling good. I'm going to seize the day. You know, it's like that type of stuff, right? And uh, that takes a specialty person to write it purposely for sync. Now there's other people who write music for their own artistry and it happens to be good for sync. That's totally different in terms of why the purpose of why you make music. So Taylor Swift, when she creates a thematic concept album, she's making that for herself and for her sound and for her 
fans. It's her era. She's making it specifically to achieve a certain uh, vibe. And it happens to be good for sync. It happens to be really good for the summer I turn pretty or whatever else or uh, Thursday night football now, right? She's all over that with, with Travis Kelsey. So sync has different purposes as well. And you want to really think about that. 90% of life is just showing up. You guys have shown up to this. Um, I cannot emphasize how much I've seen over my years in the corporate world, how important it is to just be on time to show up to the meeting. That is 90% of the battle. And uh, your presence and your aura and your uh, demeanor is really, really important. So anytime you're interacting with someone, even though you don't want to put on that smile, even though you don't want to have that energy, um, it's really important to reach down within you and be there uh, because people rem remember you by that. Um, you don't learn when you win. And what do I mean by this? My biggest lessons in life have been through failures. And there have been a ton. And one of the most beneficial things about it is that you brush yourself off and you hopefully don't repeat it again. And... Um, you know, one of the fun things about the music industry that I enjoy most is I don't repeat or encounter a lot of the same scenarios. They might have the same structure. They might have the same foundation, but you're always dealing with different personalities, different songs, different artists who have different scenarios and and different songs. So it's it's rare to, to come up with the same exact situation, but, you know, don't be afraid of, of it when you don't win because you learn the most when that happens. And then my other thing that I wanted to share, and I, I get this question a lot, which is why I wanted to address it, is are you living in an area where other musicians live? This is isolation in the music industry is counterintuitive. You really have to be able to collaborate, to be going out and to network if you want to be an aspiring music supervisor or learn more about the craft. If you're an artist uh, interfacing with other producers, seeing what works and what doesn't is vital to continuing to succeed. So this is why if anyone ever asks, should I, you know, should I move to L.A. or should I be in L.A.? My answer is always yes, because that's where these organic interactions happen, where you'll be out at an event and you'll be like, oh, you do this, you do this. Oh, OK, let's link up or, oh, I'm working on this per with, the, with this person. And then. You know, if you're thousands of miles away, while there is the technology to do it over Zoom or whatever it might be, nothing beats the in-person connection with music. So let's dive a little bit into the mind of a music supervisor and why this is so important. And I'm going to start off with this clip from Toyota. Toyota trucks. Let's go places. Has anyone heard that commercial lately? It's been all over the place, right? And uh, can anyone answer what song they're using for that? Anyone know? Yes. Price. Um, Bad Moon Horizon by Credence. Here while we're alive. Boom. There it is. So that song came out in 1969, obviously was a great hit. What they did was they sampled the song, but reorchestrated the underlying composition of that to be quite frankly daunting. It's not uplifting. It's kind of scary, right? And what we're seeing on screen is terrifying. It doesn't look like they're... Ha I mean, that's not my idea of a great tra camping trip, right? I mean, <laughs> you got lightning, you got bears, you got other things going on. Um, but as a brand, to I think what Toyota is trying to say is you're going to be safe in our car. It's going to be okay. And what really brings you into this commercial 
is the familiarity of that song. You're like, wait, what? Why? This isn't sounding quite right. Um, and it isn't. It's different. It's edited in a way uh, to really sculpt towards the picture, which I think is really effective. Now, can anyone think of any other examples where this has been done in recent years, um, especially for a movie franchise? Yeah, Nathan? Uh, us? I got five on it. Yeah, great, great one. That's a fantastic one. And I think where it really started was uh, Beyonce's Crazy in Love for um, Fifty Shades of Grey series. So, you know, that totally reshaped that and and really made people tune in. Um, so great example there as well. Um, and again, this is just something to pay attention to because visual media, whether we want it or not, enters our lives every day, whether it be through commercials with, or um, ads, whatever it might be, you know, it's really important to stay in tune to what is working and why it's so effective in the marketplace and how you could bring an edge to it when it comes your time, either as a music supervisor or as an artist in, in creating. So why do music supervisors search for music? This is first and foremost. Every single production of all kinds needs music. This includes film, uh, opening titles, end titles, montages throughout. They need needle drops or source music to go into the films. Also, uh, the curation of original music. This is music made specifically for the film. So then it could be um, an original song for it. Uh, TV as well. Now, one interesting thing about TV and placements is it's shorter form content, right? So we don't necessarily hear the whole song like we would in a film. Film has more opportunity to have a longer placement. TV is shorter. We got to get to the hook quicker, right? Like Grey's Anatomy was great at that. Uh, so one thing that's important to create as a music uh, as an artist is a tv version of your songs this is an abridged version so it's shortened so we get a sweet 30 second in and out and we could experience the song without the full two to three minute version that's already existing ads as we just saw extremely important very profitable as well these big brands pay top dollar for these sync placements and they should because it's being shown all over the world. It is also promoting a product usually, which can be seen as an endorsement, which is why some bands and personalities are very stringent on freely giving these out. Um, you know, when you're endorsing a product like McDonald's or Coca-Cola, um, or, or a car company, you know, you're risking kind of maybe there might be a recall or, you know, people are saying, well, why are you promoting that sugary drink or whatever it might be? So, again, uh, compensation is higher on that and uh, there's a higher risk as well. But uh, at the same time, uh, repetition could also uh, ruin a song like... Uh, in the 90s or mid 2000s, uh, E Harmony kept playing, This Will Be Everlasting Love. That ruined that song for me. You know, that was like always a fun wedding song. And it was oversaturated. I heard every time, like, oh my God, another E Harmony song, you know? So that you got to think about that, how often they're going to run it. Video games, we've had the explosion, especially uh, of EA Sports, has absolutely been crushing it in terms of Madden and FIFA soundtracks. And then you have Grand Theft Auto. They all have their radio stations. Uh, you have alternative media, which could be anywhere from YouTube um, to even you know Twitter or elsewhere where it's not considered like a traditional uh, form or mainstream, but it is becoming the, the norm very soon. Um, so in terms of all these, it all starts with usually a script that has to be broken down and a budget has to be assessed as to the important parts where we need to have those expenditures to make sense. Um, now for reality shows like The Voice or American Idol, there's usually a blanket type of license and a, and a 
predetermined list of songs that are all at a certain rate and it's like take it or leave it um, they could be included or not and a lot of artists usually take that rate and are happy with it because again those songs reintroduce the songs give it another boost make it popular again and could have cultural impact i mean how many of us have seen tiktok reemerge a song uh through its marketing power right they a lot of songs have been rediscovered and re-experienced um one uh, of the best syncs of all time in my opinion, was Kate Bush running up that hill for Netflix. We saw how that the power of sync and how that made th that song hit the charts again, uh, absolutely revitalize and 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 make that song so much, uh, you know, unearth it and have a new generation experience it. So that was really cool. And through the power of sync. So I wanted to show you this clip as well, because it's something we're all familiar with. And I'll just play a little bit of this. By the way, YouTube, all this is fair use because we're it's talking been about it. A long day without you, my friend. And I'll tell you all about it when I see you again. We've come a long way from where we began. Oh, I'll tell you all about it when I see you again, when I see you again. Damn, who knew all the planes we flew? Good. So, of course, this is the iconic song from Furious 7, and this is an original song. So, as I was saying earlier, this was written specifically for this film, and why is this important? Well, if it isn't, if it's a pre-existing song that's put into a film, it cannot be considered for awards purposes. It has to be purposely written. So it cannot win for best song for the Academy Awards or a Golden Globe. Um, so that's why original songs are so important because the process is typically they'll bring in the artist, watch the film and say, hey, this is the end title opportunity that we're thinking of what do you got? And then they could go write it and come back and say, this is what I've made. So Wiz Khalifa, uh, Charlie Puth are attached to it. And my question is, why does this song resonate with so many? Why was this a hit song? Well, first and foremost, you have the lyrics there. And, and this is important to keep in mind as a music supervisor when you're searching for songs or as a music maker when you're making them. Lyrics are vital to the subject matter and context of the song, but also to set the stage for why and how we should feel when listening to it. So immediately with that song in particular, it's a little bit of a lamenting and sad song, right? We're feeling remorse, um, sadness, uh, with the piano motif starting and Charlie doing his hook. But when Wiz comes in, and starts uh, laying down the verses, there's a little bit of an uplift and we feel a little bit happier and more, um, uh, definitely more, you know, in a sense of achieving and it's gonna be okay. Like, you know, we could be sad, but also be uplifting at the same time and happy that this person ever existed and was in our lives and celebrate them as opposed to being a lamenting song throughout. So. Subject matter and context, obviously this is in regards to Paul Walker and his passing and his lineage and how he was so involved with the franchise. So that was an important thing for them to keep in mind. The melody is simple. It's not too complex. I continually see within sync people, it's like they, they have so much to say in a song that they make it too complicated and you can't whistle it back. You know, people really resonate with simplicity and that's what this song does as well. The instrumentation is fantastic. We have the piano in the beginning, the bass ends up dropping. Um, it has a very modern sound that's kind of timeless as well, which is important to think of. And the production and song structure is pretty standard. We have hook, verse, hook, chorus, verse, A, B, A, B, C. Uh, we go to a bridge as well, um, which again, 
you, you don't want to follow two untraditional models when it comes to sync. You don't want people to be like, well, what's, what's playing right now? Like I'm not, I, I, I want to be in a familiar territory. And what, another reason why this did so well, obviously, is the star power behind it. When you attach two strong vocalists in their own right, uh, with Charlie being a musical savant that he is, and Wiz being one of the ta the top um, uh, rappers in the game, um, you know, it, it's a it's a combination for success and it was a fantastic pairing by universal uh pictures to put these two together and again this is done under the guise of their music department a music supervisor overseeing it and then you have a label attached to it as well who really helps promote it and um they use for that music video specifically original clips as well uh so it really resonated with a, to a ton of people so this is more for the song makers out there. Um, and again, for music supervisors to pay attention to, but covers are super effective. Um, it's been a popular trend in a ton of ads. Um, it's a great way and technique of taking an original song and making it your own, whether you're gonna make it a little bit more distorted or diminished or happy or sad. Uh, you know, the, the structure has to remain the same. The lyrics have to remain the same, but putting it in your own voice is a great technique. Uh, it's important to make it sound good. I mean, taking the extra steps to mix and master and have it equalized is vital, especially before you send it and share it with others, because a lot of songs are, are shared not in its final form, which is sometimes a problem. Uh, it's really important to also create clean versions because some of the songs that perform best resonate among all age groups. So that's another really important thing to keep in mind to create a clean version if you can, um, whether that's just simply uh, altering whatever the swear word was. Because when if you do have um, explicit words, uh, sometimes that might diminish half of your fan base uh, right away uh, just because it might not reach, you know, a targeted demographic of, of those who are able to listen to it. So uh, of the younger generation, um, create sample free versions. Um, you know, samples are vital sometimes for artistic expression. But at the same time, they could be a huge pain to clear or simply unclearable. So you don't want to get in a situation where you put samples or you take something without permission and then it ends up going viral or it ends up getting placed and you're like, oh, yeah, I did put that in there. And then there's a huge holdup and it might be taken out. So you always want to create sample free versions. You, got, you want to have the lyrics ready and available, so have those written out. It's countless amounts of times I've asked for lyrics for purposes of uploading a song or sharing it, um, even for subtitle purposes for a production. They might need it for uh, Japan or China or wherever it might be, and if lyrics aren't available, that could be an issue, so have those ready. Um, have your writer and publishing ownership available and clearly articulated. Uh, there's been some times where I've reached out to independent artists and they don't know who owns a portion of a song that they've had out for a while. Again, this just causes a holdup in the system and in terms of getting the song cleared and it makes the music supervisor super scared. <laughs> you want to make sure to register all of your songs with your PRO, your uh, performing rights organization. So on BMI or ASCAP because a ton of music supervisors use the platform song view to find the registration of a song and if it's not on there it just creates another uh detective process and missing piece of the puzzle that they have to go through so it's super easy to do i encourage all of you to try to do it and um to do it because it's it's really easy to do um another thing is as technology is advancing, we're able to add a significant amount of metadata to the audio files that we create. And this really helps music supervisors out because I get sent hundreds of songs and I might create a playlist of all the songs that I've created. And then I'll, I'll select a song, 
but I'll open it up or click info on it and there'll be nothing in it. It won't say track owner is this or please contact this for more information. Um, especially on the platform Disco, this is easier than ever to do. So I, it's vital. And also when you're naming tracks, don't have it have weird numbers in it or be like beta version 2.34 or whatever it might be. Have it be clean and, and written well and so that it could be easily traced back to you. Okay. That's even if you have to put your name in the artist as the track or email address, I don't care as long as it could be tracked back to you. That's super important. And then there's multiple files needed. So you might be wondering why, why can't there just be a WAV file uh, be sent? Well, it's a larger file, so it's harder to, you know, pass around. They might just need an MP3 at the moment to, to mock up for the placement and then eventually ask for a wave. Again, Disco is a fantastic platform where I have, as a music supervisor, have the option to download the wave AIF or MP3. And as we talked about earlier, a TV mix. Again, I know it's a lot of extra work, but there might be an opportunity for you uh, if you do create a TV mix for a song where it's an abridged 30 second version where it just hits the chorus and it's really showcasing a, a nice portion of the song. So that's some advice I have for the song making process. Um, how do music supervisors search for music? Well, if they know what they want. So if I'm working on a production and the director says, I want this song by 50 Cent in this film. Well, I know exactly the song they want. All I have to do is find out who the owners of the song are on the publishing side and master side and reach out and, and get a quote, right? So I have to research the song. Again, this is why it's so crucial to have all your songs registered. Um, find the publishers, find the master owners, and I put an S on the end of each one because some songs now have multiple. Uh, we know a lot of songs have multiple publishers, but a lot of songs, some songs have multiple master owners, uh, and you have to reach out to both. Or uh, the most I've had is just two so far in my career, but you know, you never know. Um, and then you reach out, I reach out with a quote. So I say the context in which the song is being used, the duration. Um, I might even include the offer of what I have budgeted for it. Or if I don't know the market rate, I say, you know, please provide uh, the quote for this song, uh, the stipulations of which it's going to be used for the territories worldwide. Uh, if it's an ad and if it's not going to be worldwide, you could just say it's going to be U.S. only and it's going to be run for three weeks. You know, that quote will be different than worldwide in perpetuity, which is forever and it's being shown all over the world, right? Because that's more covering a larger basis. It's going to cost more money. So this is how publishers um, gauge, you know, what they're quoting. And it's going to be different for every situation because the artist and what they've built up and market value that they've built up is going to vary based on the ask of what their music is being licensed for. Um, oftentimes there's a, might be a negotiation phase, you know, can you come down a couple thousand dollars? Can, uh, it could be a little bit of back and forth. Can you cut me a deal here? Um, and then the, the rates uh, locked in and then eventually if the picture ends up getting locked or a TV episode, and then uh, what we do is we send out confirmations saying, and this is a great moment because it's saying to the publisher and to the master owner, hey, congratulations, we're moving forward with the quote that we sent you. It's getting locked in. Um, can you send us your W-9 and invoice and we'll get you paid? And uh, also we'll send a long form or you send us a long form license which has all the stipulations. These contracts are crazy. They're sometimes five to six to 10 pages long, but they essentially have a bunch of legal jargon in it talking about the placement and any stipulations around it, uh, just so both sides are really covered in terms when it comes to the legalities of it. So that's if I know that a song that specifically needs to be used. Now, there are plenty of times where both the, the director and myself, we don't know what song to put in there. And there's a lot of music out there. There's billions of songs out there. So it's, how do I go about finding music? How do music supervisors find music? Well, 
I love to reach out to uh, publishing companies as well as music libraries because a lot of them have what are called creative sync managers. And these are representatives at each of these companies, including labels, uh, that really understand and know their catalog back to front. They know what their artists have made. They know the priorities that they are working on to push out. Like, for instance, uh, if Frank Sinatra's estate has released and, and remastered certain songs, they're going to push that out because they want the public to know about it and it sounds better. Um, if a label's working with a developing artist and I, I want a certain song that has an EDM vibe, there and but my budget might not be that great. They might uh, throw out an upcoming artist, uh, an upcoming artist who will be mo more suitable and and be able to be within the fee that I have to pay for their license. So they provide solutions. They do a deep dive into the music requests you have. There's some music libraries out there that specialize in vintage music, um, world music, all over the place. And they have a ton of gems that they might have that are undiscovered. And depending on how much context I give them uh, on the scene and what I, this scene is trying to evoke and provide, they could provide some really good stuff. Again, matching with lyrics, tone, tempo, genre, whatever it might be to really get me the music that I need. And uh, they send options in a timely manner. You know, some people need music immediately. Uh, especially on the TV side, uh, as we'll hear from Jen today. Others in film, I might be working on a film for two years, so I just need to gather some music now, put in a playlist, run by with the director eventually. Um, but they typically send within the day, if not within the week, uh, to dive in, and they, they send me all their music. So um, I've discovered thousands of songs through through their playlist and what they curate for me and it's been fan absolutely fantastic so now as an independent artist or if you're not with a publisher or even if you're a music supervisor and you want to learn more about a production or a music supervisor you know i'd first research what company do they work for are they an independent music supervisor are they part of a production company like myself at millennium and what type of genre do they work on? Because uh, especially at Millennium, we do a lot of action thriller, uh, and that requires a certain type of music. Um, every production, as I said, has a certain vibe. Uh, like Marvelous Miss Maisel, you're not going to pitch uh, modern day music for that show because it's based in the 60s and 70s. Uh, same with Mad Men. It wouldn't make any sense. So you really got to know your audience and who you're catering to in order to get your music to the, in the right hands. Uh, IMDb has every single music supervisor listed, every single production listed. So again, if you're making a body of work that you feel could target a certain type of production, uh, I would encourage you to look and see who are the people behind it who are in the music department for it. Um, some of these music supervisors are super active on their socials. Others aren't. Some don't want to be contacted whatsoever. Others are very open to it. It's a wide mix. It's just like any profession. And it's how do you build a relationship with anyone in any profession? Well, you get to know them and you become their friend. And how do you do that? Well, you might meet them. You might get a referral. Um, but to really get in their mind, I would also encourage you to look up their name and see if they have any bio or any YouTube videos or interviews. Um, some have really gotten out there and been in the spotlight for a while. Others are just emerging, but to see how receptive they are and uh, get on their radars is a, is a good thing to do. And building a rapport, um, again, you're doing that right now by being in this class with me. There's other ways about going about it, whether it's attending their panels. And again, this is, well, that's why it's important to follow people on socials and just to see what they're up to because they usually promote it. Uh, there is an unsolicited material policy that a lot of people follow where they cannot accept material from people that they don't know. And again, this ties into the sampling issues. Um, some people, uh, you know, recycle materials and uh, quite frankly, they just want to deal with their trusted constituents because 
their butt is on the line when it comes to a production. Uh, they can't risk meeting someone for the first time and putting something in there that isn't accredited. Also, as I was saying earlier with the paperwork process, if you don't have those ready or if you haven't walked through the process already, that train might be leaving without you. So having that experience or having someone do that on your behalf is vital as well. Um, referrals in this industry are of utmost importance. Um, it's how I've gotten every job that I have in, in, in this industry. It's through uh, networking and someone vouching for me for my next role and uh, cultivating those relationships, again, through networking events like this and others are really important. Uh, researching the companies that would be a best fit for music. You know your music best. So you could ask as many people as you want to listen to your music, but you really got to identify the genre that you specialize in and how you could get it in the right hands and who's going to represent it best for you. Um, taking notes while watching your favorite programming. Um, one of the shifts that I really made in this career was from enjoying content to analyzing it all the time. It's always a job now. It's never like just sit back with popcorn. Like you're in it and you're critiquing and you're dissecting what, what is going on. Oh, no. oh, they use this song. Oh, they're going that route. Oh, very interesting. And then one thing that I always do is stay until the end to watch the end credits. Um, you will learn a ton about uh, this because it will be the, mer the music personnel credits um, it, within the department why not message one of them say great job on instagram i would just watch this film you know you never know if they're going to respond on linkedin whatever it might be you also see all the song credits so you'll see who the song is written by who is performed by and courtesy of and the courtesy of is really important because that's really the company that provided the master for the track um and you might see some repeated names in there and that means oh well that library of music is getting a lot of syncs and a lot of placements they must be doing something right so um, it's important. Again, a lot of people ask me, where do I go to place my music or who could really promote my music? It's like, well, you got to take the first step in really knowing where it could land and who and who could represent it best. And there's a ton of places out there that could do that. So I wanted to show you this clip real quick. Okay, does anyone know what song this is and who the artist is? Feel free to unmute. Is it Bob Seger, Old Time Rock and Roll? There you go. Price is killing it with, uh, with the, uh, sh the live Shazams. So Old Time Rock and Roll, um, this was performed by Bob Seger. Does anyone know what year this song came out? Okay, I'll let you know. So it was 1979. So this is an example of um, a song that is pre-existing, that's been in the marketplace, and then used as a needle drop in this film. Now, obviously... This song had to be cleared prior because Tom Cruise is singing along to it and dancing and it's a high energy song. Can you imagine if they filmed this scene and there wasn't a music supervisor and what would they do? 
I mean, you would have to cut away from him singing that whole time, and hopefully they have a different cut of it. Um, the Billboard chart position of this song, by the way, in 1979 was 28. That's what it peaked at. The year of this film was 1983, so it had a couple years already to be in the marketplace, to get a little trajectory, to hit the radio waves, to be marketed, to be played a ton, uh, sold a ton for Bob Seger to tour. Uh, it's obviously one of his biggest songs. And uh, after this film was released, Risky Business, uh, it charted again at, at, in four, at number 48. So that, again, shows you the power of film and song and the marriage of the two because it revitalized this song. It allowed it to um, increase in billboard positions. So I was just going to show you this promotion as well. My forever partner is in this house. Here's the social security. I'll be shooting that shot like two It's never too late. Got the best of my um, so that promotion right now is running on The Bachelor, and this is using Best of My Love by The Emotions um, as the underlying composition, that song that we're all familiar with. Uh, but an artist named Paul Russell added a little, he actually released this song on TikTok at first uh, without the proper clearances and then um, ended up getting signed to a record label because of this song doing so well. It just got paired to The Golden Bachelor, not only as their promo, but also in the very first episode of The Golden Bachelor. And uh, last week it was number 99 on the Billboard Hot 100, and this week it is number 74. So it's rising the charts because of that. And uh, I was actually the trumpet player on that song as well. I was asked to play the re-record on it. So... Uh, it's growing, and it just shows you the power of sync as well uh, through through that pairing. Uh, one second here. My Was everyone hearing that okay, by the way? Through their speakers? Okay. I wanted to show you another example. Uh, this song was the end title song for Catching Fire for the Hunger Games. Another original song that was curated for the purpose of this film. Uh, now, what ended up happening was Coldplay expressed interest in um, the series, and we gave them a private screening of the film, and they wrote this song as the end title song, uh, which was a, a fantastic pairing. A lyric video, an official lyric video was made for this, not an, a, an actual music video or anything like that. And again, this was just a really nice supplemental tool uh, for the film itself. And uh, the Hunger Games ended up, the, the very first Hunger Games had an original end title song by Taylor Swift and the Civil Wars. The second one was Coldplay. And then the third one was by Lord. She curated this whole soundtrack and her song Yellow Flicker Beat was the uh, end title song for that one. So I wanted to show you just a little clip of this one as well. I know we're running a little behind. Jennifer joined us, but a classic sync. Pretty woman walking down the street. Pretty woman, the kind I like to meet. Pretty woman. Now, when you get these types of synergies, the world kind of explodes, right? I mean, the movie itself is Pretty Woman uh, with Julia Roberts, and this song uh, really resonates with this scene because it's a montage of her shopping and them having fun, and it's uplifting. And this song by Roy Orbison was written in 1964, so it's an oldie and a classic considering that this film came out in 1990, and it's still paired so well. Everyone knows the lyrics. Um, as we were talking about early, earlier, the lyrics resonate, the simplicity of the song structure. Um, it's all something that just creates good and fun synergies. And the fact that it is already known, you kind of know how the scene is going to play out within the first two seconds of watching it because you know how the rest of the song goes subconsciously. So I wanted to talk about the sync music ecosystem and I want you to really think about where you fall within it 
as an artist making music or as a music supervisor and the type of songs that you need to license in order to be within whatever project you're working on. We have the top 1% of music. These are the classics. These are immediately known. They're number one, usually billboard charting positions or in the top 100. Although I will say a lot of more recent music in the top 100 falls off a lot quicker and don't become classics that we necessarily know. They might just be there for a little bit. In terms of licensing, they're probably going to be rather expensive. Um, and they might have multiple publishers. Uh, earlier songs that were curated ha only had a, a couple writers, if, if only one. Uh, songs these days could have five to ten writers, which could also equate to multiple publishers. So uh, that's kind of crazy as well. And also something to keep in mind when you're writing your songs um, and, and realizing how important it is uh, to write pe songs with people that you're going to maintain relationships with because uh, all it takes is one person to say no who owns part of your song uh, to not license it and then it won't go through. Uh, Mid-tier songs I like to refer to as songs that might get some radio traction. They might be trending on TikTok, similar to the song we just heard with Paul Russell, Lil Boo Thing. Um, they might be culturally relevant for the time period. Um, and uh, again, you know, these are songs that we probably know the melodies to and have left an impact on us. And then there's another tier of music called production music. So this is music that may or might may not have been commercially released. This type of music is really cost effective. Um, it helps build atmosphere for a scene. So it could have an EDM type vibe or um, a jazz type vibe if you're at an upscale restaurant and you want to emit that type of feeling. And a lot of these songs are what is known as one stop so you only have to go there to clear both the publishing and the master and with a lot of these songs you automatically know that it's going to clear at a certain rate so that brings a peace of mind to a music supervisor as well whereas if they're reaching out to a top one percent song uh, their clearance might get denied whether it be through budget reasons or uh, the context in which it's being used. Um, you know, it might be a violent scene or there might be drugs being used. So uh, that's why production music is so great. And what I wanted you to think of, where does your music fit in? Um, as I said and started this presentation with earlier, only 10,000 people make above $100,000 on Spotify. So the odds that you're within the top 1% of music it's not gonna, you know, it's, it's, it's a rare thing. A lot of people's music lands between mid tier and production music. And I wanted to just share a couple examples of, of some of these libraries that really specialize in production music that I've all licensed from there's APM, extreme music, universal production music, mega tracks, West one music group, four one one music group, countless others as well, where they all have this library of music. And they're always craving new music as well because music is always updating and evolving. This is why Sirius XM has channels by 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s. Music tonally shifts every decade and we're able to comprehend the music that is within those periods because it has a certain production value. So think about that when it comes to your music and where it could be hosted as well. And then the last thing I wanted to leave with you is how I break down music as quickly as possible so that it can be secured. Um, when I'm working with a director and we're not really getting anywhere when it comes to the music required for a certain scene, this is how I break it down. And I use, and I call it the GETS method, G-E-T-T-S, so that you could remember it's genre, era, tone, tempo, significance. So, and I see VA, uh, my go-to music is all one stop. That's fantastic. We love to hear it in the chat. Um, let's get some music. So first you have to identify the genre. Ba breaking down a song by genre immediately eliminates so many different possibilities in the direction of which a song could go. So of course we have EDM, jazz, rock, um, classical, whatever it might be establishing the genres of utmost importance, the era in which the song you're searching for, is it present day? Again, by decade, are we talking 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s? 
recorded music has only really been around for roughly 140 years. So, you know, you already have a limited window in the recordings that are available as well. So keep that in mind. Tone. This could be something as easy as happy or sad. What type of feeling are we trying to emit from a certain song? The tempo. Are we wanting something fast paced or a little slower paced? Again, you don't need to be a musicologist to really have these terminologies or to discuss music, but to have it and narrow it down is really important. And then the significance. This ties into the budget and how important it is within a scene. So it could be an opening title song, an end title song, a montage, whatever it might be. Um, that helps really you know, place the emphasis on the spend of the song as well as how important it is to get because you have to fight your battles as a music supervisor and as an artist you have to create your art uh, depending on how important it is for a certain scene. So that is my uh, hour-long presentation into the world of sync. I hope that uh, you all enjoyed it. Um, you know we could talk about it for hours. Again I have an 11-week course at UCLA Extension and um, if you ever want to take it, uh, the next signups will be for winter. So hope to see you there. Um, but for now, I wanted to introduce our guest speaker who has joined us, uh, Jennifer Pikin. And I'm just going to read you a little bit of her bio because it's absolutely insane and amazing. Uh, Jennifer Pikin has overseen the music for dozens of movies and over a thousand episodes of television. A thousand. I didn't read that incorrectly. There are three zeros behind that. Her skill for sonic curation efforts have been recognized by her peers, including myself. She was nominated for a primetime Emmy Award for Outstanding Music Supervision and won the Guild of Music, Supervisor, music Supervisors Award for the Best Drama for This Is Us. Her music supervision includes credits including This Is Us, Smallville, One Tree Hill, uh, Alias, Lost, Las Vegas, The Package, The Healing Powers of Dude, Just Beyond, Workaholics, Game Over Man, The Neighbors, um, and countless others. And she's currently supervising the way home for Hallmark. So wanted to bring her to the stage and, uh, I'll have everyone unmute to give a, a little round of applause. Welcome Jennifer. <laughs> Hi everyone. I see some people I know. Hi Sam. Hey Jennifer. Hey Jeremiah. Hi Jason. Hey. I see some of my pals. So nice to see you, Adriana. Wow. <laughs> see, and we some get new faces that I don't even know. So nice to see everyone. Thanks Perfect. for joining us tonight. And Ryan, thank you for having me. Of course, thank you so much. I'm so excited yeah. to have you. And um, you know, I just I basically dove in and gave a brief overview of Sync. It's hard to really curate it for everyone who's a music supervisor or aspiring one, as well as an artist and a curator who wants to get more involved into Sync, but um, you know, one of the things that I was just kind of showcasing was over the decades, how sync has always remained powerful in that you take a great song and place it with a scene and it could really make it resonate and pop even more. Um, so I think, you know, my first question for you would be over the past decade and specifically, what is the biggest shift that you've seen in the sync world, um, based on your experience as a music supervisor? Well, there's a couple of things. So first of all, the ability for artists and songwriters to create music at home, in home studios, is A, has made my job easier because mm. there's so much music out there and then made it a lot harder because there's so much music out there. So um, it's made it, you know, I probably get like a ridiculous amount of music every day and as a music supervisor, it, it can be a lot. So um but at the same time, I have so many more options. Mm. Um, the other thing in the sync world that I've noticed is that the that this is actually going to help a lot of the indie artists here. That the publishing companies and the record labels, the the cost of sync uh, sync licensing for for artists that are signed to major labels has gone up quite a bit. So for for me, that makes me go out to find these. I know I love indie artists. I'm a big fan of indie artists. I love working with indie artists. So for me, it's like, oh, 
a song's a song. A great song is a great song. And and that's just, you know, something that I might think is great. Someone else might not like. So it's just, I'm like a curator mm. of music. I kind of look at myself that way. Um, so there's, there's, I actually say there's no really bad songs because you never know what I'm going to need or, you know, I put stuff in my back pocket. If it's really esoteric or something really out of the box and really just, you would think would be in a TV show, I might be able to pull out maybe not this year, but maybe years down the line. Mm. Now, I can't remember everything, and so I, you know, try to keep my music library, I take notes, I try to keep um, good notes on all the songs that I get, but it, it's, you know, day to day, I get so many songs in. But that, I think those are the two things, cost, and then you, I, I came in a little bit at the end of your um, um, PowerPoint, and you were talking about the production music libraries, and those have such amazing, you know, those are, a lot of those are indie artists that they're signing. And um, so I use them quite a bit. Yeah. When I can't afford, you know, a Katy Perry song or a Doja Cat song or whatever song I'm trying to license at the moment. Um, I can grab a song. I can, you know, grab a song from one of those libraries and get it cleared very quickly and very easily. So time and money. Mm. <laughs> those are my two things. <laughs> Absolutely. And I like what you said in terms of, you know, you could be looking for a really bad song. You really don't know. I mean, you're acting as a facilitator on behalf of whoever you're working for. So thinking that every song made as well has to be this work of art or perfect thing as well isn't necessarily the case. Um, you know, I like for Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard, I licensed Rebecca Black's Friday, right? Like that's a notoriously comedic song uh, because it was so poorly made, <laughs> uh, you know, and it resonated with a lot of people, but it, it adds to the humor of things. So, you know, funky music and, and fun music and silly music is really important as well. Um, when it comes to music and sync, what are some trends that you're seeing right now, um, that are working? Um, earlier I played, uh, a Toyota commercial that is playing a clear water uh, revival song uh, and, um, you know, using those familiar songs in a mo more modern context for trailers have been really popular. Is there anything else as well that you're seeing trending right now? Yeah, they call that trailerization. Yes. Right? That word is very trendy right now. Um, you know what? I've noticed a lot of people are doing like um, – female like jazz vocals. I don't know if you've gotten a lot of those, sort of um, been getting a lot of those. I haven't had a lot of usages for them, but I've noticed that it's a trend in music that I've been getting um, sent to me. But I don't, I think, you know, the way I listen to music is it's, you know, there's stuff that I listen to personally and that's in my car, maybe that I'm singing along to or whatever thing. And then there's things that I'm working on a project. So because I'm so, you know, I put like I, I have blinders on practically when I'm working on a certain project. I'm looking usually for a very specific kind of sound and tone, and usually a first season show, specifically on it. I'll specifically talk about TV. You know, we're setting up the tone and the style for the first season, mm -hmm. and then that might translate like we did with This Is Us, the first season. We had a specific sound we used. You know, uh, Blues Run the Game, we had Gun Stevens, we had all these like amazing songs just in the pilot and that kind of set up our tone. But then we started using some older songs like Cat Stevens. And then all of that kept translating to season to season. Mm. Um, so I guess for trends, it's for me, I, you know, like all of a sudden there'll be like lots of songs like, um, about like when an art, artist gets really big or even a composer gets really big, like American Beauty, when that was so big, that score was tempting to every project I worked on. Right. And then there'll just be certain songs that just keep getting tempted in over and over. And then they're usually, if they're that popular, they become very expensive. Yes. So, and because they're that popular, I usually don't even want to use them. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, again, oversaturation, right? My oversaturation. And I actually had a song tempted into one of my shows. And then it was on a big commercial and then they pulled it out. Not that oh. commercial song that I had, but they were like, oh, wasn't that used in a commercial? Like within a week of me having attempted the show. So they were, I'm like, okay, we'll pull it out. Like I kind of got it. It wasn't the same version, but. And there's no way you would really know, right? Because the publishers and that's. Yeah, right? Yeah. I'm, I mean, there's. And this is 
the crazy thing about my job. It's like there's producers and directors and editors, and then there's like the producers' kids. Like this is their favorite <laughs> band, and then you've like you've got like so many people, and everyone has access. When I started in this business, I would be very specific. Here's your songs you can have. I would go to the record store. Mm-hmm. I'd pick I'd pick up the, the CDs. And, and that they would get what I have. Now everyone has access. Mm. I'll never forget my first meeting I was in, and there's iPads had just come out, and then people were like, on their iPads, I didn't have an iPad yet. And they're like, oh, what about this? What about this? What about this? So my job has changed over the years. I actually like when, you know, it's very collaborative. Music supervision is very collaborative, and I'm a very collaborative person in general. I think that's a good quality to have with a music supervisor. And so I, I'm a curious person, too. It's a great... I think it's a really important um, skill to have to be curious, and you can you can be curious about a lot of things. You can be curious about art, and you can be curious about nature, and you can be curious about music. and And I bring all that into when I'm thinking about just my day to day life, how things come to me. Mm. But um, I think I got a little off track there. I know. That being said, <laughs> you know, every project. That what it comes down to. So I'm usually, especially with TV, you're setting up the sound, you kind of got that sound. And then if say this whole season changes, the next season takes place in a different era. You were talking about eras and time periods. And like with This Is Us, they went back and forth in time. Mm. I'm on a show right now that's all time travel. So we're time traveling back. Every episode I get a script. I don't know. I kind of have an idea of where we're going for the season because I talk to the creators of my shows. And usually if they're very open and I'm going to, you know, they share with me what's going on and they want me to know. So I'm kind of get a little head start. But when you, when you have different years, you, you have to play songs from 1999 or 1990 or whatever year it takes place. And then this is us. We kept going back and forth in time every episode. And I, sometimes I wouldn't know until I got the script. Mm. And I feel like uh, TV, especially I've, I haven't worked on a TV show yet, but because it is more condensed, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but 30 minute episodic to 50 minute as opposed to an hour or two hours as with film, uh, songs need to get to the point quicker. And uh, can you talk a little bit about that process? And so interesting. I, you know, I don't even think of TV and film as different because mm. I'm usually a storytelling. Mm-hmm. Um, so when a song needs to be played for longer, this is us, we play songs for three, four minutes. Mm. Sometimes you wouldn't hear it and be pl- playing a lot under dialogue and we play it through four different scenes in, in different eras and we didn't, we originally started on a show and we said, okay, if we're in 19, for present day, we'll only play present day songs. If we're in, you know, the 80s or 90s, we'll play those songs. But then we s- sort of just kind of melded them all together. Hmm. So we would play a song underneath for like four or five scenes. So, and I think the biggest difference between, I started out in film. TV wasn't that big when I started. And then I got big in TV because no one really wanted to do TV. Everyone just wanted to do film. <laughs> so TV was like kind of like the redheaded stepchild kind of thing. Like no one really, no music supervisors just wanted to do it. Um, the biggest difference is it's so fast. Mm. You have it's like you've got to pivot on a dime. You don't have a moment to like. You always have to think ahead in a film. When I work on a film, I'm like, oh. I mean, there's always like time challenges, but there's like be on a film for like a year or two i just been working on an independent film um i started last year it went away for like six months because they still were getting funding and finishing it and then all of a sudden last week it all came back Mm. okay we need all these songs cleared so i think tv if you can it's like boot camp you have to be on your toes um not that you don't have to be on your toes for films but it's you might be working on an episode that's shooting and airing now with like the Netflixes and Hulas, you're spending a lot more time on the shows because they don't air right away. But like a show like This Is Us aired every week. And so I'd be working on an episode and I might mix an episode Monday. It might air Tuesday, you know, might air like the next day. Wow. So um, what I like about it, TV as opposed to film, I could use like 10 songs in one episode. And you're talking, you know, a, an episode really – it's a 30 minute on TV. It's 22 minutes. It's about what you're working with around 21, 40, 22 minutes. And an hour show is about 42 to 44 minutes. Right. 
on average, Netflix can do what they want. Like the bigger, you know, they can kind of fuss with that, but generally it's 22 minutes and 44 minutes. So you're just going to be fast and furious. And the great thing is I get to use tons of music. Yeah. In a movie, I might only have 10 songs. I might have 10 songs in an episode. Right. Right. So. And I like that. You were talking a little bit about different personalities getting involved and suggesting songs and having to be, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, collaborative. But just so that everyone is aware, how much creative freedom do you have on certain projects? I know everyone varies, but I've been on projects where they have a clear direction. They already have a majority of the songs picked out. And I might have to say, oh, well, we can't afford that one. But are there times where you get to ultimately pick every single song is it always that way or what would you say the percentages are and the differences oh gosh i I mean i'm gonna go by every project's different Mm -hmm. so i've worked i've gotten hired on shows on like movies where they're like i had a director say i i don't even know what i like Mm. which is kind of a gift for me because then i can just kind of start giving ideas and then kind of working together to try to come up with the sound um but it's pretty much collaborative that you've got your editor who's dropping music in. And as a music supervisor, you don't want them to be pulling from your fav- their favorite playlist because their favorite playlist might be, you know, either songs you can't even afford or you can't even, are, aren't even songs that you can even license. Right. Like, okay, let's come in a Beatles song. Like, it has been licensed before, but the time and effort and money to get something like that, you're just like, yeah, it made that seem great. Yeah, of course <laughs> it did. In. And then, right, you know, recognizable songs. Um, tend to bring back memories, brings back memories for me when I have heard that song, mm. where it came from, all those things that, and it's that familiar, familiarity that people love and it's catchy and that's why old songs are getting used all the time or hit songs. Um, but there's like the editor, there's the music editor, there's the producer, there's the studio. If you're, you know, not an independent film, but on a bigger film, there's the studio executives from, I've gotten notes from everyone. Yeah. So everyone and everyone. Okay. So not everyone knows about lighting. Like everyone has something they know about music. Either they mm. like something or they don't like. But you know, wardrobe might be not your thing. Production design. But when it comes to music, everyone has some sort of relationship to music, whether they love it or not, or whether they listen to it or not. Um, maybe they were in high school and that was their favorite band, or maybe you know, there's all these things that concert their favorite concert. And I notice when writers. And I'm working with writers, so showrunners and writers. You can tell where their music, what era they came from, and where <laughs> what their loves are. Like right. Big jo- Billy Joel fan. Well, we know we're going to use a, big, a Billy Joel song in this TV show because he's a big Billy. You know, he grew up in the same. You know, it's just like there's all these like things that go into it. Um, so I just try to go with an open mind, and um, not dig my heels in too much because. For me, you know, I learned the hard way that that's not a good way to go and always be a really good listener. So I really try to listen and take notes. I always have a pen with me or, you know, I'm so old fashioned. I don't even take them in my phone. I just kind of write them out and then maybe I might put them in my phone later. Always have a pen and paper with me taking notes. I think that's really important. And even if you're a songwriter and you somehow get an introduction to a music supervisor asking questions about what they're really looking for, if you get, you know, a meeting like that. Um, but there's, it's just, for me, I've never had a, a movie that I've had to pick all the songs. Mm. So this indie film that I just did, they had pimped in eight or 10 songs. No, there's like eight songs and I had to replace five of them and I went in a totally different direction. So when you were talking about genre, this is like, it just went out the door. I'm like, they had present day songs and I kind of went with like, I have this idea. I'm going to use like old cowboy country music totally different what was tempted in yeah. and it seemed to work and um, we did it was an indie film we did have a lot of money and so I went to the production music libraries and I went through their you know the listen and they said some really cool authentic um, old stuff and some newer stuff and, and it and it worked oh great I haven't, even, I haven't seen it all tempted in that's the crazy part I just you I just provide it my computer you know I had like the scenes I worked with you know I get all the scenes I worked now I put them up to picture I said here are these songs for this this and this and um, we, we just got and we got done um, worked on it last year and now it's completely changed and they're delivering it and 
I was really proud of the choices and, and it didn't cost a lot of money and that's great. So it's, it's not always about the money. No, it isn't. And I think that's a great segue into the next question is ultimately, how do you find this music? I mean, you had an idea of the genre that you wanted to replace that music with, but um, depending on what you're working on, what what is your technique for reaching out for music? How do you go about doing it? Um, well, first thing I do is try to go through, because I use disco, I have a lot of songs already in there, and sometimes I'll get inspiration just by going through older playlists I have yep. that I've had for years. Um, but sometimes it's just me kind of going down the rabbit hole, like maybe I'll start reading blogs, and maybe uh, if I get inspiration from the script, from the conversations, I always try to have conversations with my director, my producer, whoever my point person is on the show. Um, music editors tend to, can I always say this, is they can be really important to, because they're sitting in the room sometimes, especially lately, if they're not even in the room, they're on Zoom and they're cutting with some, they're with the director and producer maybe for 10 hours in that edit day. Mm -hmm. So they'll sometimes be like, hey, this is what's going on. So they'll give you information. If that, so it's really important to have a good relationship with your music editor. Yeah. And I've had not that good of relationships with music editors that like drove me nuts. <laughs> so we just put in what they wanted and I was just like, what are you doing? Right. Last minute, I'm changing everything. So if you can, you know, and there's certain music, uh, yeah, not music editors, right. editors that I've worked with over and over. So they've like worked on projects and they're like, either, you know, there wasn't a music supervisor. So I get, uh, they'll suggest me to work on it. Cause I, and I like working with them and they like working with me. I make their job easier. They make my job easier. It's like a win-win. Mm. So that's great. Yeah. And, uh, the, this next question, so this is kind of like an Amazon question. If anyone's been through the Amazon interview process, they have these Amazonian type of broad, open-ended questions that will drive you insane. Uh, but can you tell us about a time where you had a difficult decision to make on a project and how it came to a resolution? I don't know. I don't feel like they're ever, I felt they're not difficult, like challenges. I don't even think of them as difficult. Mm. This is every every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm pivoting every single day on every project. There's always something. I have to be thinking ahead. So um, it's, it's, I don't even look at them as, as difficult. I just, it's like part of the job. Yeah. So if you're wanting to be a music supervisor, you really have to be kind of have a, I don't want to say a thick skin, but you have to really be organized. Yeah. And I've always, even when I'm, pitching songs for something I might have backups already I have a plan B, mm. plan C sometimes in my head for different scenes or different projects that I'm working on yeah but um it, okay this is my favorite thing it always works out mm. <laughs> the show's always been aired I had this meeting recently where I got interviewed and I'm like uh, uh, and it was with a showrunner who had just done 15 seasons of a show so she was and she wrote like 90 of the episodes wow I mean that's a lot of you write a couple of episodes a season that's a lot so right 90 and it's insane so i said i don't know i was like it always gets done right somehow yeah and he laughed and so that was I'm like oh i probably didn't get that job but i got it oh good nice yeah you you survive a hundred percent of your worst days right i mean we're all still here yeah and i haven't slept at night and i get you know sometimes i'm like concerned that something's not going to clear in time and, mm -hmm. and um you know, I try to balance my life, and I think that's really important for in no matter what you're doing. Mm. If you love what you do or don't love what you do, is is having downtime and doing things that you know that you love besides music and um, like I was talking about art and nature. And is it is it going to museums? Is it going to the beach? Or is it going to just to? It's it can be a very you know some days are really hard. Have you ever been denied a clearance and then? did something whether it's increased budget or provided more context to get it across the line has that happened a lot in your career oh my gosh i, I can't tell you what the song is i can't yeah. use it so i had a song yeah it could be a, an amenity no worries yes i can't and this one i can't because it was so insane so i had a song tempted in that the, it was in a movie and um we suggested a fair fee there was a sample of another song in there so we knew there was a sample and it was like a song from like the 80s that was really obscure so i, I thought it offered a fairly fair fee and i don't remember what it was but you know it was like 
forty or fifty thousand dollars all in. Twenty five to twenty five months for a movie. Okay. That's a, a nice fee. That's a good fee. Yeah. Right? Yep. And um, it got to, so the scene was like a little. This is what we talked about. What gets denied? The scene was, it was a comedy, so the scene was. I can't even remember exactly what was happening. But That's it was fine. very dark, but very violent, and also kind of funny and weird, mm. and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. So it got denied, and then the the director and producers are like, "Can you go back to him?" I'm like, "Well, okay, we'll go back to him." Yeah. And they denied it again. And they denied it maybe the third time. <laughs> and then I gave them options. And all the options I gave were great. Like, I, I'm not just saying they were great because I, they were like really solid options. Some were less money. It's like some were indie. Some, I just had all these options. They had Temp Love, which I'm sure a lot of you, I don't know if you talk about Temp Love, but they were, they had this Temp in and they wanted this song. So I had to pull out a Katy Perry song that was in this movie. <laughs> Which was a very expensive song, and another song, and the, the, and it was MFN for the publishing, the master, and this person had the publishing, I guess, and the song came in at six figures. Oof. Um. So that was kind of crazy, and I so when we finally went back to them because I, I have a uh, I I've been doing this a long time, and in the last couple of years I've hired clearance people because I feel like I I've taken that paperwork, even though I negotiate and get all my deals set up, which I like doing, but I now have someone else. Pass it on. <laughs> yeah. Since yeah. I've been doing it long enough, I feel like I, I deserve that. Yeah, you do. Absolutely. But it's, but it's not always fair to me with supervisors because I have to usually pay for them out of my fee. fee. Right. So for me, perfect for me at this point in my career, in my life, and it works. Right? Yes. So most music supervisors, unless they do a lot of films and a lot of TV shows, that, that I'm like, not doing as many as I used to. Right. I have family and things going on. And I totally understand. I, I mean, so, a lot of, I mean, a ton of music departments, Netflix, uh, you know, they have built in clearance departments for that very reason. It's, you know, it's a complicated and time consuming process that could take away from the creative and what you're trying to achieve. And especially if you're on an episodic series and you're still dealing with the clearance or, or a revision to a contract, it's, it's really time consuming. So I, I 100% yeah, understand it. Yeah. And usually what I'm doing is like, I'm not doing actual the contracts. I'm not doing the licenses. Yeah. So I get hired to do the quote request and a confirmation letter. Right. So a quote request is sending a request out to saying, I would like to use this song. That doesn't mean you're going to use the song. Right. You're just sending it. If you're an artist and you get a quote request, and um, there's a really funny story that someone told me they had, they got a quote request and they thought they were, um, they thought they were at the finish line. Oh, party, no. And they threw a party oh, no. <laughs> and they had a pizza party and the song never came up. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and it was just kind of... Like, at least they, they got some pizza, pizza out of it. <laughs> they ended up using the song in another episode. Yeah. But it was like kind of like they were like, oh, it must be at the end. And then the party, you know, like, and there's a lot of people at the party. So a quote request does not mean, doesn't mean just because you get a quote request from a music supervisor does not mean your song is being used. It's just asking to say... This is the rights that I want. This is the scene. Are you, uh, you know, I'm amenable, amenable, amicable? Yeah. Silly. There you go. And you sign off, you sign off, and then that scene might be cut out. Yeah. And, and, I, and it could get cut out on the mixtape, or the song might, the scene might not get cut out right. on the mixtape, but the, you're like, oh, the, the, that's where you mix all the music and the dialogue, and it's called the mix stage. And basically, you're like, I know this happened a lot. They're like, oh, we don't want that song anymore. And then sometimes they ask me on the spot, do you have any more ideas you can clear right now? And you're like, excuse me? Like, yeah. what is going on? Do you have to be ready? And I have my computer with me if, I'm, if I happen to be on the mix stage or they'll call me um, and change the song. Mm. So this person who thought their song was going to be in is now not in mm. because they just either took the whole song out and they changed it. Again, this... They put foreign instead. Or they put foreign instead. Yeah. So it's like a constant... Music supervision is a constant... Things are always changing. So if you want to be a music supervisor, I know there's some people that are artists on here and some people that are, want to be music supervisors. And, and you can do, there are people that are artists and music supervisors. Um, so, and, and that, yourself, and, you're an artist and yeah. you're a music supervisor. So right. you want to, you know, so, yeah. pivoting is, is, is definitely a word I have come to um, embrace. Absolutely. And as you were saying, it's not the fault of the artist that it didn't cross the finish line. Um, it's really just politics and 
um, the situations that evolve on the mixing stage, the director could one day just say, no, I don't want it. Or like you said, they switch to score or their budgetary issues and they need to pull it. So there's all these different scenarios um, that can occur. And I think another good point that you brought up is uh, the music supervisor might reach out for a lot of quotes and they don't necessarily follow up if it doesn't go through because they have so much that they have to work on. So it's really on the rights holders to say, hey, you know, where are we with this? Did this end up going through? Um, I, even for Expendables, when I announced uh, the soundtrack coming out, I had one publisher reach out and be like, hey, did this go through? And I'm like, you would know by now <laughs> if it did. Or like, it's coming out tomorrow. But, um, you know, they they need to ask for that because uh, the the while it's a nice touch to say, hey, unfortunately, this didn't go through, it's not always customary or on their radar to uh, update them unless of course it is a, a confirm um, because you know the quote stage again it's more like just whenever you reach out for a quote on Yelp it's like saying hey you know how much is this service for okay thanks bye and then uh, do we get the approval can we move forward with it so yeah, I wish I could tell people more often that I, I can't use them but it's I just don't have enough time I honestly don't have, I could work 24 hours mm-hmm I physically can't work 24 hours, but like there's enough, if I, I can't even answer them all my emails. Right. And I'm getting so much sent to me. Right. So like when, so I like the Thinking in Sync book. I don't know if you're familiar with that, that Amanda Creed Thomas book, yep. Thinking in Sync. It's one of my top five favorite music supervision books. And she kind of writes out like the primer on the mind of a music supervisor that it's called. And it's, and it's not like a really, if you're not a reader, like it's, it's really easy to read. It's not a, it's not it's like a, a it's, 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 it's not like a big like Donald Passman. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's this book that she wrote and, she, and it because music supervisors can't get back to you. It just it would be a full time job to respond to all that. That's actually why I put yeah. up my uh, LinkedIn away message is because um, it was just unmanageable and it would be a full time mm. job to do, unfortunately. So um i think that's what she says in the book like don't expect a response right I that was like, and it's and not personal like, at all no, yeah it's not personal it's just i wouldn't be able to i wouldn't be able to do my job yeah if i answered i could spend all day answering emails all right i got a couple more questions uh <laughs> what is your favorite placement of all time that you have ever seen of someone else's work i i know you oh, i don't know God. if you have on the top of your mind but if, so, or if something stands <laughs> out to you and you might not necessarily know who did it, but. Well, when I think of music, I think of like an era. Like my first movie that I really stood out to me was like when I actually thought of music placed in a film. Yeah. Was in um, The Breakfast Club, Don't Be Forget About Me. And yep. the end song. Yep. Um, I was like, that is so cool. And I think the car- it, 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 it ends the whole movie. And mm. Simple Minds, and I don't even know if I knew who Simple Minds was at the time. I don't remember, but I was like, that was like my first like, wow, that's a cool song in a movie. Yeah. And if I, you know, keep going forward, they're just like different things. Like, um, I love. Um, I'm more of a director person, so I'll like. I love Wes Anderson films. Yeah. So like his use of like ooh la la faces, um, in Rushmore. Um, I think about. Mm-hmm. Thomas Anderson and how he uses music. Mm. Um, was it in um, the Amy Mann songs in Magnolia? Mm. Uh, more recent, like Baby Driver, how they Oof, the that driver. opening scene, yeah, yeah, the opening scene, and then how he just every single it was a character. You know, mm. It was you got in the mind of the character. He had I I think I either saw him talking about it or read about it. It was like even like the the gunshots in that movie were temp time to the to the music wow yeah so like just the thought process of like directors um that really think things through and um is more of my thing than just like one specific movie yeah and what about uh your favorite placement of all time uh, whether because of its impact or just the story behind it what's the favorite song that you've ever placed in a in a visual media aid it's like saying what kid you like better uh, <laughs> well, you well you do have a preference i'm sure <laughs> no oh no okay some days it's different 
I right. change every day. Anyways, um, I just had so many. I just feel so grateful. I've had. I've worked on so many amazing projects. Um, I'll just throw a few out. Like this is us. I we really wanted a Van Morrison song, and I'd never been able to clear a Van Morrison song before. Mm. And so we were able, to, especially for TV. So some people like will play will license their songs for movies, and some people like oh, I don't want to be in TV. Yeah. Um, so about Into the Mystic and that. Um, I, I have a really um, good place in my heart. All of Workaholics. Love that show. And so it's so it was so challenging because it had it wasn't the smallest music budget I've ever had, but it was. Let's put it this way: on some shows I had, I had the same amount of money for a whole season of Workaholics with one episode of a TV show, with less than one episode of another TV show. Mm. So it was always a challenge. But as I'll never forget going on the meeting, he's sitting in the waiting room and he, Anders came out and got cereal. And then Adam came out and mm -hmm. got cereal. And then um, Kyle plays Carl and he came out and had cereal. <laughs> and, Blake, and they're all like checking me out, like who's in the waiting room, who's getting, you know, to meet on the show. And I had watched the pilot in my house and I had my headphones on and I'm listening and I'm laughing out loud. Yeah. And how often you really laugh out loud? Like you're, you know, people, I, they're all unknown. And so that show really, they gave me an office. Fully torqued. So, <laughs> yeah. um, I, if you made it through all 10 seasons, I think there was, they broke it up. It's only seven seasons really, but it was like 10 that we did. Mm -hmm. They just split it up differently. If you made it through all the seasons, you were like family. So yes. I, I made it through every season. And then there was like, they even did a group photo of all the people that made, made it through every season. Oh, and fun. they were just fun. Yeah. I working with them. So I feel like when it comes down to, I don't have a favorite project. It's favorite people. Mm. Who do you mm -hmm. like? Who do you, who is like, who do you want to talk to? You mm. know? So it's not about a project. It's more about the people. That's great. And uh, lastly, before we open up for a little Q&A, can you just tell us a little bit more about your Music Supervision Master Course? Well, um, I developed this master course. I, was, I also taught at UCLA, taught the UCLA Extension course a couple of times. And um, when I started out, there was nothing online, no music supervision courses. I had to learn everything, and it took me years. And... You know, I always thought I wanted to do my own class, and then the pandemic happened, and I had the time. Mm. So I made, you know, I took everything with a labor of love, um, and I just took everything I learned from teaching the class at UCLA, and I just tried to make it better. Yeah. And I had, you know, it's all, it's not a class, all go at your own pace. So there's a mentorship aspect if you want to learn more. But basically, it's some people, you know, and, you know, I, I went to college, but I don't think it's for everyone. And I feel like if you want to go, I'm sure USC has a really great program and Lindsay teaches there and she was one of my coordinators. She was my intern. And she's, yeah, but not everyone can afford to go to USC or NYU or anything. So I kind of wanted to make this course for like, it's always been a mystery. No one ever wants to talk about like how what music, like we're gonna like keep it all like low key. And we have a great community now with the Guild of Music Supervisors doing lots of music and media events. So it's changed. So I kind of just came from a, diff a whole different thought process putting it together. Right. I didn't want it to be a typical class. Definitely. And I share, you know, I do interviews like you're doing, and I, you know, and there's a lot of paperwork. And I think about that's another thing about music supervision that you know. It's not always easy. Some people love paperwork. So yeah. <laughs> love paperwork. Like, great job for you. Absolutely. And there are people that love it. Yeah, true. Um, well, thank you so much. Uh, we'll go ahead and open it up for some questions. If anyone wants to raise their hand, we could bring you to the stage. So uh, we'll start with uh, Price. Hey there. Um, yeah, my name is Price. Um, I, I was curious about... Um, for me, I, I'm I'm somebody who's trying to get started as a music supervisor who doesn't really have a lot of um, a, a lot of context in or a lot of connections in the music industry. Um, I went to music school as a musician. I did my master's in violin performance, but um, and I've and I've long had a love of like sync, you know, pairing music with imagery, 
that was part of what I did when I was in school. Um, my question for you is: Is there? I, I've, I've kind of been, you know, interacting in his space and trying to get um, get in touch with more people who are music supervisors and or people who are in sync, you know, and trying to reach out and network. But I'm a little. There's a little bit of my kind of what I'm thinking is: How do I get started? What's step one for someone like me who, okay, after networking and is, is, it, is it the best move to get a job or is it better to kind of build up and go out on my own and build up something on my, on my own? Well, it, it, there's two ways to look at that. So some people, like as a music supervisor, you work for yourself, so you go job to job. And I have friends that are like, there's no way I could do that. I'm not the kind of person that just can't have a job and get a paycheck every week. So when you're an independent music supervisor, you're working for yourself. So you might, so you have to look at what, you know, do the pros and cons of what works for you. What I would start with, and these are things that I did. I um, I did. I went to the film schools. I went to gaming conferences. I had no job. I like went around and just kind of like showed up places and started offering offering up your your what you know about music supervision, get, offering it up to people. And so that's how I started. Um, you know, I think the guild is a great place um, to be involved with the guild of music supervisors. Their events are really good. Yep. Um, you know, and it's interesting because I meet with a lot of executives and a lot of them have really, like, if you get these, they, they a lot of them are musicians, like classically trained musicians. Um, and even at the record companies, I was meeting with um, someone and I'm like, how'd you get, I asked, well, how did you get this job at, you know, Sony Music? And she was, well, I was a classically trained pianist and my, my, my mom was like really hard on me and I played piano every day and, and then I like, you know, she got an internship somewhere and then she kind of fell into it. Um, but I feel like sometimes you're not going to be able to get the job right. You know, there's not that many jobs. Like, try to get jobs that are close to music supervision, whether I would pick a PA. I would like, pers I've gotten people, I still get people coffee. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and to this day, I'm not kidding. But like, take jobs that are easy to get you into production or around film people or music or TV. Because those kind of jobs can lead you. Uh, my one of my assistants was the stand-in. This is great on a TV show, and he asked Anne Klein, who's a music supervisor on the show, and then she ended up taking my UCLA class, and and then ended up interning for me and working for me. So you just never know where mm. you meet these people. Mm -hmm. So um, and it's planting seeds. I think sometimes you might not hear. I remember someone. There was another music supervisor. I was an assistant at. Um, for a record label in the sound, there were soundtracks of the soundtrack department, and this guy, and he'll tell the story. Barkley Grace, I don't know if he's still music supervising, calls me up and he's like, "Oh, I'm, I'm looking for a job." And I was like the assistant answering the phone. I'm like, "Well, I heard this job at Sharon Boyle's company, mm. which, and John Houlihan, if you've heard that name before, he's now head of music for Fox. He, he, he ended up working there, and then this guy got the job there. So it's like, I just kind of like talking to people." Um, you never know who's going to know. And I think going to mixers um, and putting yourself out there and taking the uh, music supervision course at UCLA or taking a course to get more knowledge so that you have some place you, you're helping, you're going to help someone, like whether an independent film or a student film, will give you some experience because that's what you want. Right. Now, if you don't like the, the independent world, because some people don't, then I would start like going to all the labels all the record labels all the i just saw an internship up at warner chapel all the publishing companies publicity marketing mm. all these marketing departments at Netflix, all these there's all these like ancillary fields right i don't think uh, he didn't mention it but i was like an executive at sony running their their film and tv department in publishing so and they brought me into the music supervisor at the time and um so i got an in-house job but it wasn't for me I, it was a great job. Maybe now that I'm older, I probably like, you know, I look back, I'm like, well, you know, I wanted to be more creative and I had a lot of meetings. So like for me at the time, it wasn't right. But I worked, I worked, I kind of just, and as I met people along the way, um, you know, you never know who you're going to work for because I've had my bosses work for me over the years, like people, you know, and I've stayed friends with everyone that I've worked with and, you know, building relationships with people and keeping your word and being on time and all these things are all, you know, helped me along the way. I wasn't like a big goal person. I didn't like go, oh, and 
I hear these people have the goal, okay, in one year I want to do this, in five years, and I don't think that's the bad thing. They're just, I never even thought that way. I just kind of was like rolling with what I liked and I did. And, right. And now I think a little more of it as, you know, I guess I would be like an elder in this. Like, <laughs> I think more of like, you know, like what my younger self did, maybe I wouldn't do now, but there's, I think there's more opportunities out there than, than I think if you, you know, there's just so many different people pitching music. Just even getting that experience since you're on the other side pitching, which is very, very hard. Because I was on the other side at Sony Music publishing pitching to people. And I got to meet like every music supervisor. Hmm. <laughs> because all of a sudden I was pitching to music supervisors and I was a music. I, so I, that was a great, I called that my graduate school in corporate America. <laughs> Three years I did at Sony. And they're very good to me and very, I'm very grateful for having that job. Very nice. Thank you, Price, for the question. Uh, is it Montice? Hi, I'm Monse. Monse. Um, happy to be here. Just bear with me, just reading from my notes. Um, but I'm an LA based singer songwriter and I also work in marketing. I started writing and producing my own songs in 2020 when the pandemic hit. I wrote a bunch and ended up presenting them to my brother, Cristobal, who works for a trailer music company. And he's just a really great producer. And we're currently in the mix and master phase of what will be my first EP ever. Um, I currently don't have like a huge following on social media. Um, ultimately, my dream is like to hear my songs on TV shows or films. I've also written some songs in Spanish, which I think could make me stand out. Um, even just like working somewhere where I'm just writing lyrics and like melodies for like a trailer house or something, kind of like what my brother does, but he just does like beats. So like, ideally, I would just be like writing melodies all day. Um, like I said, I haven't released any of my personal music yet. But um, I could totally play the track my brother and I wrote specifically for Sync, if you guys are curious. Or I could also like send it to you if you're interested, but I would love to know what you think. Can you send it to Ryan who can send it to me? Ryan, would you? Yeah, that? definitely. I'll, I'm going to give out my emails uh, so that uh, everyone can send or we could connect later on. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's interesting. Well, you've got definitely an in, right? It's your brother. So you, he's, you've got a knowledge right there. I mean, I don't want to like, I mean, Billy Eilish wouldn't be Billy Eilish without a brother, right? They mm -hmm. together, the team, right? Yeah. So you've got, you've got a partner there and he's got experience. So you need to like build on that. And I'm sure he knows a lot of people. I've heard his name, I think. What, let me just say what company he works for, but I feel like I know him. I've been going to all the, I went to all the trailer panels, um, because I've never really done trailers, so I'm like more interested in like learning about that. Um, but that's a great start. I mean, you just and you've got to you know get your music out there. Some people don't even want to be artists in tour; they just want to be play songs in projects. Yep. And that's really where it's at. Because touring, like you said, in 2020 there was no touring, so you have to have to figure out how to you know how you're gonna make a living in it, and income, unless you're independently. Yeah. Do that, which. And not really. One of the not my world. <laughs> no, one of the, one. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say one of the most reoccurring things that I hear are artists who are on tour who want to stop being on tour because they've done it so much and and start scoring or being on the other side of things where they mm -hmm. because you know touring is alluring and it sounds really cool but there's no place like home and it's really tough to sustain on the road, especially with the current conditions, uh, lingering. So, um, you know, uh, definitely lean on that connection and keep creating because you're at the infancy stage of your career. And I think it's really exciting time to see how the market reacts when you put out this first EP, you know, marketing is so important, how you're going to distribute it. Are you going to have, uh, you know, TikTok to a company as well, because as we've seen, you know, all it takes is one song to really take off and for more eyes to to be on you. But you have multiple angles as well. So being like bilingual is 
uh, a really powerful thing uh, to have in your your toolbox as a musician and could bring different uh, genre styles and uh, again a, another type of audience space that is you know uh, that could be tapped into massive massive, massive. Uh, yeah ar- arguably like rising the ranks faster than uh, especially with all the awards they have as well um, and eyes on it so um, yeah excited to to check it out and you know keep going as well because um, this is a, this should be a really fun and exciting time for you Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. You're welcome. Uh, we'll go with Jeremiah. Hi. This Hi, is a Jeremiah. crazy moment for me right now because hey. both Ryan and Jen were like my professor, so <laughs> it's a crazy moment. <laughs> and uh, I just want to say real quick, because Price's question really had me thinking like, you know, it took like me talking about music and film to come out of my show and actually network with the music supervision community and my podcast that you see in the background that's like me nice animated multiverse right there <laughs> so uh but yeah but uh, i'm truly thankful to meet y'all and have y'all uh your words and, and advice and teachers and everything about this so thank y'all so much for doing this uh my question and this honestly goes for both uh you jennifer and ryan uh we were talking about uh the song see you again as an original for Fast and Furious. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious, um, could you explain the business process of between the film studio and you know recruiting the artists, what kind of agreement deals that are made and uh, you know who owns what? You know, like how, how's that uh, process going business wise? Absolutely. Um, Jennifer, just for you, context for you earlier, I showed uh, Fast and the Furious music video for um, See You Again with Charlie Puth and Wiz Khalifa. So obviously an original song that was made for that film. Um, yeah. And maybe you could talk about some original songs that you've had to curate for your projects. And I, I don't know if you could give out the details on it, but um, when it comes to I guess, curating it and the ownership of it as well? Well, every, every, again, every project's different. Yep. Like some shows, um, they, you know, the major studios want to own the track. Yep. So if you're looking at big artists like Liz Khalifa and Charlie Poop, they're going to want to own that, so they're going to have to do a deal. I don't know what your deal was, but it's going to get a, it's, it's a big process because you've got record labels and you've got managers and you've got lawyers and you've got to get signed off from even the record labels just to get the approval for that artist to do the song for your project. Yep. Um, so it could take weeks or months. Um, I just had a song written for um, The Way Home, and um, I specifically picked, because I knew we didn't have a lot of time. I and I always wanted to work with this songwriter and this artist. She wasn't like a big name like Charlie Booth or, or Wiz Khalifa, but she's got a nice following. And so she, they wanted to own the publishing. Mm. She got her writer share, um, and we didn't. She didn't actually record the song. We had it, just the song written, and then we had all the characters on the show actually sing the song throughout the whole season. So we must have used it like six or seven times different kinds of different like so, and now the second season it's on the way home and if you go to the hallmark website maria taylor um, was the artist and she's uh, in a band called azure ray and um she's had tons of placements in tv and i just i sometimes go with my gut and i just had a feeling i had a few people right i didn't go out to like a lot of people which is very typical you might someone might go out to like a lot of people have a song written. I had very few people write it, yeah. but I just knew a little bit about her life, and I thought she could nail it, and she did. And so when I went to her, she's like, "I'm like, so you?" She's like, "I've never written a song for a film or a TV show." <laughs> she's got tons of placement. Um, anyway, so it's in that particular deal. It, it took some time, and we had to deal with her manager and and, and lawyers and. Yep. And it just, it, it's a process and everyone, I always say the same thing, every process is different, but, and even when we had songs written for This Is Us, it's 
studio wanted to own that too. Mm. So any songs I've ever had written um, for my show, especially TV, um, you know, the studios really want to own it. Yep. That's, you know, there is something to say about that, but you know, if you're a really big artist, um, you might have the leverage to say no. Yeah. And from a studio perspective, the marketing spend behind the film itself is so much greater than um, that of the music uh, from the national ad spends to the worldwide distributors of it. So for them to be attached to that type of project, um, you know, it really does benefit their career tremendously because it's almost like uh, it's bigger than themselves and they get to be a part of it. And um, when those synergies can match it, does really nice things and complement each other which you're looking for right like you want each party to be supportive of each other and sometimes the music outshines the film like um uh but you know the tides usually rise with each other and fall with each other like the charlie's angels film the most recent one they had an all-star track it was with i think ariana grande lana del rey and miley cyrus um and you think that would be a hit single, but the film itself didn't do well. So really the music got buried with it as well. But if you have a hit film and a hit artist like Trolls with Justin Timberlake, Can't Stop the Feeling became a summer anthem before the film even came out, you know, uh, it's worth its weight in gold. And you might have more... Happy is another one. Happy <laughs> with... Uh, the Minions, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mike Knobloch actually tells a great story on that. He's the president of music for um, Universal on how many revisions had to be made for that song because it wasn't happy enough yet. It wasn't there. And it, can you imagine giving feedback to Pharrell, like telling him, hey, it's not quite there. It's like uh, he's Pharrell, like, you know, but, um, you know, that's where he – got together with Hans Zimmer as well and they became good friends and um, obviously that became one of the biggest songs ever made for let alone for visual media but just in general uh, and uh, a really feel good song so uh, thanks so much for the question Jeremiah yeah it, it varies on everyone really um, thank you yeah and good seeing you, uh, good seeing you. Nathan I want to be in your podcast <laughs> you told me you were gonna invite me. Oh, see, there oh, we go. Man. We're networking. Look at this. Yeah. Awesome. It's coming back soon. Okay. Good. How's it going? Uh, I'm Nathan. I just want to thank you guys for putting this together. I feel like this is very insightful, and I appreciate your time and insight because you know there's not a lot of information, or now there's more, but there wasn't a lot of information when I first started with sync licensing. I come from. Uh, I used to work for a music library doing the admin as well as composing for them. Mm -hmm. And I was on as a quote unquote music supervisor, but it was nowhere near to what the extent of you guys did. It was more like curating playlists and cue sheets. So I wanted to know what are some ways to provide value to you when working with you from a musician or production library standpoint, like buying your you know Dropbox storage or something, or like a disco subscription. Um, what are some ways that you know a musician or production library can really provide value to a music supervisor, and make their life easier? I, I can go first. Oh, yeah, of course. Go, yeah. Oh, no, you could take it all, please. No, you know, it's so interesting. I don't like Dropbox. <laughs> yeah. Because people pull the songs off and then I can't find them. Like, mm. I give people on Dropbox. So for me, I've uh, streamlined with Disco. They've kind of cornered the market in it. They, they were an advertising agency and they kind of like have it very thought out very easily. Um, I can't even send like spot. Like, sometimes I'll just want to do a quick Spotify playlist for my creators of my show and they don't even like know how to use Spotify. Mm. Like they're just like, I can't get on my account. I can't do this. They don't have time. So simplifying it, I think um, I interviewed one of the owners of Disco and I think like he said like 90, I don't know if it's true, like 95% of music supervisors, you, at least I think in the U.S. use Disco. And I put it off for a really long time and I think I started using it in like 2000, I don't know, six or seven years ago. And it's kind of changed my life because I can just like quickly use it. They have tutorials. I can like put songs into playlists really quickly. And then when I send it to my creators in my show, they can either download it or just listen to it and tell me what songs they like. Yep. So I, I, I don't get any money for plugging them. I don't get any kickback. I have nothing to do with them. I just know that they've made my life easier. 
And because, and I still get stuff from Hidetail and Dropbox and SoundCloud. Then I have to download it into my file. Then I got to load it into my disco. And when we talk about how much time a music supervisor has, you want to make the experience as easy as possible. You want to have all your metadata in there. As you know, you've worked at a music library. You know how important that is. The year, the tempo, like some little keywords about what the song's about or what era. Um, as many of those that you can put in there. So if there's a search that I'm doing, sometimes that helps. Yep. Um, but metadata, metadata, metadata. It's important for all the, the songwriters out there. And 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 not sending too many songs. Sometimes I like get playlists that are just so big, I just get overwhelmed. So I like ten. <laughs> <laughs> That's a I sweet know, spot. Like, I love that. It's an arbitrary number, but you know, if you have eight, don't send songs that you don't think is right for the scene. If you hear them, you know, but if you only have one song, send the one song. Yep. Then sometimes, you know, sometimes you, that other extra song or two might be what I'm looking for for another scene. So you never know. But if it's more than 10, I just kind of start like that. Well, I can't like here. I need to like. Yeah. It's kind of, it's kind of tough. Yeah, it's tough. There's so much other things to listen to as well. So it's kind of like curate it. Curate it as best you can. And ask the music supervisor how much time is it end of day? They need it by the end of the day. Mm. You need the TV. You need a lot of stuff by the end of the day. But sometimes I get stuff the next day, and then all my pitches for that day that I sent to the three to five songs of all these songs that came in, I might only pick three. I might not have any. Mm. I might have. I might have to keep wanting more ideas. So, um, I hope that answered your question. And nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you. I appreciate it. Yeah, some of that stuff was in your course as well, and I appreciate the course. Anybody who's taking you know, taking it, definitely worth it. So I appreciate that. You're welcome. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, Marv. Hi. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Marv. I'm a producer based out of New York. Uh, shout out to Ryan for putting all this stuff together. I really appreciate it. I know how valuable people's time is, so just shout out to you for that. Um, Thank you. I just wanted to... Uh, piggyback off Nathan's question because I was just thinking like as a producer or even an artist as an indie artist how do you st stand out or like pitch out your songs or beats or whatever to a music supervisor and like know okay they're looking for this or that because as even you guys were talking right now I'm like researching music libraries and there's like thousands of songs yep. in each library so it's like how do you Millions. <laughs> millions. Millions of I'm not kidding. Some of them have like a million songs. Yeah. And they pride themselves on that by the way. They're like million yeah, I was literally just Googling, I'm like, yo, how do you stand out in a music library? Or is there like another way to streamline it or make it easier or like direct contact? Like which way is like the best, most efficient way for you to be put yourself in front of somebody that could really pick your song or whatever? I think maybe do all of those things. You know, there's the sync reps. If you can get a sync rep, send your songs to sync reps because they have really good relationships with music supervisors. Send them on your own. You know, I think you can't just leave it up to the sync rep because they also rep a bunch of songs. So if you can get a non-exclusive deal and say, I'm going to pitch them as well, they're going to pitch them, you know, you're, if you're sending a specific song to a music supervisor, make sure your headline is stands out write an email that has a little information about yourself, not a super long email, because I'm not gonna have time to read it, right? Mm -hmm. It's not gonna happen. So uh, maybe put the genre, like I got a song, I was like specifically looking for a folk singer, songwriter song, and it just happened, it came in my email that day, and the girl had never got a placement for, and the next thing I know, it's in my show. And oh, she's not, right, so it's like, it's timing, and I think you've got to plant seeds and you've got to just hustle. Yeah. You know, I don't think there's any one easy way. Um, to be honest, it's just, it's, 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 it's not easy because I've been on both sides. I've been the pitcher. So now I, I knew how hard it was to get a placement. Yeah. I was, I mean, I've like had a very rounded career. Like I've had this, like, I've seen things from all these different perspectives and I know how hard I, I it was hard to get a placement. Mm. So you so, said email would be like an efficient, real way to like short. You can bar. put your stuff, and yeah, and even put your stuff up on TikTok. So I watch TikTok. I like watch Instagram. There's 
you kind of have to like spread yourself. I mean, you can't go spread yourself too thin, but you've got to like try, see what works for you. See where you're getting, you know, your fan base. Seeing, I mean, that girl, um, M. Byhold, who had that numb little bug song. She was like sitting in her room, shaking her uh, antidepressants, and she was like <laughs> bummed out. And then she all of a sudden like went viral. Wow. Right? I mean, literally, she wasn't trying to like go viral, but she did. Mm. Right? So you just don't know what it's going to take. I think it's going to be a lot of things. Yeah. Maybe, you know, like maybe you, maybe you, if you, maybe you think your music's good, good for video games. Like try to focus. So there's so, so many ways you can go. Like, is it something good for that? Like try to figure out where your music, you think your music might work. Yeah. And uh, I'll add to that in that you're seeing all these libraries now and some of them might not be capitalizing on the music that you specialize in. And one of the great parts about a lot of these libraries is that they have a search function that you could just sign up for and browse yourself. So you want to be somewhere where the market isn't already uh, because they'll showcase and say, hey, we have this type of music. So if you're making cut, like what type of music do you specialize in? So recently I've gotten into pop. I've worked, I'm working currently working with this artist. Um, he's very versatile, but he's got uh, literally just started a band. So he's like doing rock music. So I'm working with him. So rock and pop a little bit. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, um, as it was a reoccurring theme throughout our discussions today, there are uh, the top 1% of music when that cannot be catered to, we have to rely on really solid production music or as I said, mid-tier music that um, can easily be found and licensed and uh, be affordable. So uh, again, if you create a body of music that is trendy, that is uh, with the times and can be placed within one of these libraries, um, your time comes where you send an efficient email, as Jennifer was mentioning. Um, it has all the metadata. It might have like you know, maybe 10 of your best tracks, but if you amass a library of 100 songs uh, that are all with a certain genre that resonates with people and is very syncable, that is what those libraries are looking for because they'll be like, okay, this person's on top of it. They have great production. They could pump out these songs. Uh, they have good lyrics or without lyrics. Again, that's another great option to provide a lyric and a lyric list track. And um, they have it all tidied up. And your journey will lead to, uh, I don't know if you already have a disco account, but like what it looks like within that platform so that it is all organized and you'll be able to eventually um, hopefully secure a deal with one of those libraries and have your music hosted there. And then uh, the market will determine if it gets pitched or not, but they might do a showcase on it. Jennifer and I receive hundreds of emails a week of certain themed uh, playlists that these libraries send out it could be seasonal it could be because of the holidays it could be because of um, certain trends that are happening right now um, i have a buddy um, who i guided his name's joe sparrow and he makes a lot of music that sounds like the weekend um, in that type of, of genre you know and uh, I was like, dude, this is so syncable, you know, because people want that dramatic, romantic, pop type of music. And it ended up, he ended up pitching it to a library. And a month later, I got one of those blasts featuring his music. It was actually kind of cool. It came back full cycle. But it was like, I knew that the market wanted that and needed that. He just needed a little bit of advice on what to do to get it in the right hands so that it could be syncable and pitched out. So I think a lot of people are in that, a similar situation like that. It's really funny you mention that because the artist I work with, he sounds a lot like The Weeknd too. So mm. It's hot, you know, it's hot right now. And the other thing, put something in your email that stands out. Maybe, you know, maybe something that, uh, you know, I don't know, just try to, because you never know who's going to be reading it. Like something mm. about the artist or maybe something about the, the a little something just yeah a little but I, I'm not thinking off the top of my head like a part yeah. just something about like the artist or if the artist is touring any you know if you're working with an artist that they just played at Lollapalooza <laughs> I don't know. Fairgrounds because you know, it's sometimes it's 
just giving a little information more about the artist, even if it's just a little tidbit that might catch my eye. Like, oh, that sounds interesting. Like, oh, let me check this out. Yeah. Because I do, I do, I have found songs, like I said, like just sometimes it's timing and sometimes there's something in the email that just speaks to like, oh, that looks interesting or that sounds like that's something that I'd want to listen to. Yep. Craft of, you know, take your time crafting an email. And, you know, there's some music supervisors, you know, like make sure you're writing it to the person's name. Like, you know, if I get an email just saying hi, that means they send it to like 100 people. Yeah. If you can, you know, say, hey, Jennifer, I'm a fan of your work on this or this placement. Just give like a little maybe something that you know my work. If you don't know what I'm working on and you send me something and you're like, oh, I'm like, I mean, I'm very different. A lot of music supervisors work on several, 10, some of them work up on like 10, 15 projects at a time. They're in different phases, so you never know what they're going to need. But um, maybe point something out and not something like you don't have to like, for better term, like kiss your ass and say, oh, <laughs> just like, just like, you know, something authentic. Come from like what you, from, from who you are. I think that always comes through. Great point. Thank Thanks, you. Mar. Um, and we'll go, is it Hannah? Sorry, I can't see the rest of your, the name. Yes, it's, it's Hannah. Okay, yeah. great. Hi. Yeah. Hi, thank you both so much for, for hosting this. What a, what a great night. And it's great to just kind of meet some new faces and see some familiar faces too. But, it, and I feel like it's a bit redundant now too, but, um, well, number one, I wish we had time to know what you're both listening to in your car, especially when you kind of <laughs> like what I, I want to know what inspires you. But that's for another time. Um, but uh, a question I have here and what Mark kind of touched on as well is as indie artists do, and I've had the opportunity to be really lucky and get to work with some of your colleagues like Lindsay and Anton. Um, and I think a huge advantage of indie artists is uh, and that can clear both sides of things is that in itself and that's something um that i'm curious like and also I've, I've heard mixed reviews and so it's nice to hear some light like shed on like you actually are open to emails too because i've heard like some mixed reviews about that that people are like okay don't send me an email you know so I, it's, it's almost like i've i've been a bit um shy to do that but interested of like okay as far as indie artists go I think a huge huge advantage is our ability to like clear both sides of things really quickly which I know Jennifer you were like touching on a little bit and I'm curious like how to get on that like disco list of like okay if you need something cleared like immediately it sounds like you both have kind of those go-to things and what I'm hearing you say is just you know, building those relationships over time, and then also um, music libraries. Is that like the two only ways, I guess? Um, and also, like, how do you how do you get on that that list of a music supervisor? And are you more likely to like be put on that list if you're if another music supervisor was like, hey, I really recommend this person? Yeah, I would. If you definitely had a placement with Lindsay or something, like, hey, I had a song. I would, this is something going back to. To Mark's question, I would say, oh, I had a placement in one of Lindsay's projects. Well, Lindsay was my intern, she was my assistant, and now she's president of the guild. And I love Lindsay, and I've known her for, you know, so long. it's like, oh, that's good now. Like, but you know, one stop—that's the word, the term. Sync and all, you know, sync and master one stop. You could even put that in your your header of your email, yeah. one stop. But you know, every music supervisor is different, and every day is different, and um, you know. I kind of believe if nothing's going to happen, you're just sitting there waiting for something to happen. If I'm sitting in my house, you know, so you kind of have to like get out there. It's yeah. hard work. It's really hard work. It's, this is not an easy place to be. So I'm not going to like sugarcoat it and say, oh, you're going to get like a hundred placements. And, and sometimes people do and something, but it's, it's, it's like, a, it's networking. I would say that's like a big part of even networking with other songwriters. Yeah. Um, going to different, you know, I remember when I was starting out, I went to lots of, and I was like on the other side, you know, I went to lots of like, I would go see bands and then I'd run into people and then, you know, I would, you know, not everyone's going, that's not for everyone, but I did that and, 
when you do build a relationship with a music supervisor, you never, you always want to be, um, they always want their job to, you know, we're just, we're firefighters. We're always, putting, <laughs> they just want everything easy. Like I want to work with people that I don't have a problem with. Like I just, I go back to the same people, but I go to different, I, I notice that certain people that pitch me songs from these sync companies, there's a few, there's people that I really like get it. They're actually, mm. um, Nathan had said that he was a music supervisor at a library, and some people would just send me really great options. And I try to find those people, and they send them to me over and over, and I can use those playlists, and, and I, I build relationships with them, whether it's a small library or a bigger library. So great maybe, point. You know, maybe get your songs to a sync rep, but that's, you know, that's, just, that's just one option. I don't think there's one, one fit for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, I had all of as the last question. I know we got a couple more hands raised, but uh, I got to be mindful of Jennifer's time as well. So, um, Olive. Hi, hi, Jennifer. Um, thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Um, also, hi, Ryan. I'm taking your uh, yes. Good yeah, to see you. Yeah, Thanks for coming. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm excited. I uh, went off with a great start. Um, and uh, I had a question for you. So. My friend is directing like a grassroots indie film um, and she's asked me if maybe I could do the music on it, supervise, but um, the thing is there's like a zero dollar budget um, <laughs> and so um, it's still kind of up in the air, but I had an idea that I'd love to get your opinions on. Um, my idea was to maybe coordinate like a writing camp post-production with a few emerging artists, top liners, producers to write music. Um, free of cost, like how the rest of the crew is also uh, navigating production um, and right based off of the film, like maybe set it two weeks apart, um, maybe have like a wash session and just kind of get some ideas. Um, and I'm also debating maybe bringing on signed or published artists, maybe indie, uh, depending on what's kind of like just the easiest route, um, working with like DistroKid to get it onto DSPs maybe as a soundtrack to a, promote the music, but also promote the film, um, and eventually have the artists perform the music at the opening um, to market the music, the film, and also potentially get listeners to go on to Spotify or Apple to listen to the music and gain some form of royalties, whether it's like 30 cents or a million dollars, I don't know, uh, just to get out there and kind of have the music and also the film um, advertised, and it's something I'm willing to personally invest in, especially since I'm very early in my career, but I want to know if my idea might be viable or if there might be another cost-effective way that you guys would recommend I go about this. Well, I always call this friends and family. <laughs> right. You get all your friends and family, right? They're going to help yeah. you. I have like a pile of friends and family. Um, you know, I'd like to pay artists for their, their work and there is, is there a, there's got to be some sort of budget for the making of it, right? So yeah, maybe even so, 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 you know, that's a hard one. I mean, you can do licenses, you know, for like a dollar. Mm -hmm. Like I've had, I've actually done licenses for a dollar that people have given me the songs because either they're like a friend or family, <laughs> like literally a family member or a friend. Um, but you know, I really do believe in paying artists, so this is a tough one. Um, as for you, I would definitely take this on as you know an opportunity to learn, right? And use your skills that you learn in Ryan's class to put them to work. So that you're investing in yourself, and that's really important. Because um, when I started out, I, I literally, I, I mean. I have licenses. I, I just, I really just, even if it's like a hundred dollars, I don't know. I just, I'm really a believer in paying artists. So even if you could say to them, like we, if they have 10 songs or, and, or, or do a step deal with it, if it, if it gets picked up, if they get a distributor, then they'll make money. That's another way to do it. Um, so at least then, then they're, you know, their art, that's their art. Um, and some people will be like, I'll give it to you for free. I don't like, to, I don't like, I don't really like to take stuff for free. Mm. Um, even if, it, 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 I think you have a great opportunity. 
and like the song camp I think that's an interesting way to go about it because they want stuff specifically written I would stay away from any major publishers because <laughs> it just might be more of a I'll give you an example I just did not this last indie film but the indie film before that he was a really big music video director and he was like I'm friends with this band I did this video I did this video I did this video my manager's friends with this person and then all of a sudden we went for the clearances and no one none of the publishers even though he made, directed their videos said okay now some artists can are big enough artists can go to their publisher or record label and say i want to do this that does happen and i've had that happen whether they're performing on the show or, but in your case i would just try to like do the best you can mm -hmm. I would kind of try to push maybe for a tiny budget if you can. Okay. <laughs> right? I mean, it's worth asking. Um, and I would, and again, I would do like a deal. Like maybe if it, if it gets picked up, then they get some sort of money. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I, I will say I did like how you broke everything down and are very ambitious when it comes to the project and you're seeing it full scale in terms of it being released and all the opportunities and having the band perform at the premiere and there's just so many variables and I would encourage you to just focus on your first and foremost role, which is securing the spots. You know, the, that other stuff comes later in post. There might not even be a premiere. Um, it might not even be appropriate to have a band perform at the event. You know, um, there might not even be really a need for a soundtrack, especially if the songs aren't featured that much. Like there's so many variables. Um, of course, we hope it all comes out to, a great, you know, reveal to the public. But um, I think, as Jennifer was saying, uh, you have to be realistic and like that these tracks are probably going to be gratis uh, and um, offering some form of back end if it does get picked up by a streamer or some other distribution platform would be beneficial and a win win for everyone. But it's really about how you pitch it, right? This is such a relationship based business. But if you're like, listen, this is an indie film. This is a great opportunity for you as a band and for me uh, to add to your resume. And if you're just frank and upfront with them and not saying, oh yeah, you know, maybe we could get you a couple hundred and when you have no backing of it or promises, I think if you're just upfront and tell it how, is it how it is, you could see if people are receptive or not. And there should be a ton of people out there and especially in your network uh, who are open to it. Uh, and because it's a really fun opportunity and you never know where it could lead to. So um, uh, congratulations as well on having the opportunity to do that. Did you already say yes and you're on board? Uh, I haven't given a definitive answer yet. I'm mostly kind of torn because of the budget thing. I wanna make sure that I'm able to like show up to the best of my abilities. With the yeah. I have. But we're gonna talk about it a little bit more, but with your guys' input, I think um, it'd be best if I just kind of negotiate maybe a budget, 20 bucks, 500 bucks, just something in my pocket to be able to do this and make sure the music is solid, but also like artists are getting paid and everyone has, I don't know, food on their plate. Yeah. So to yeah. To get a couple lunches or something, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. cool. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Olive. Well, I will have everyone uh, unmute so they could give a big round of applause uh, for Jennifer uh, for all of her time here. Uh, one second. And I'll give uh, the official round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Thank Jen. You, Ryan, for putting this together. Of course. Fun. Jen. I love talking to artists. I don't get to do this that often, so it's so nice to get and get to see people too which is really nice yeah absolutely and, and any parting words from you or any plugs feel free to to share away just you know keep keep at it it's, it's a hustle and you gotta work hard and and don't let you know the bad days get you down because the sun always rises the next morning somehow <laughs> and it's just a new day you know if someone's not returning your emails and it don't take anything personally there you go i mean my one of my favorite books is the four agreements and if you haven't read that book it's another small little book but it's a, it's a, just kind of a way that i live my life you know be on time your word is your word you know these are little small things but it really 
in the music supervision world and in, and in the world in general. You really have to, you know, be your word and, and dot your I's and cross your T's. Because if your song's not clear to blend you, and then all of a sudden you find out there's a sample or something in there that you didn't know was in there, you might, you know, it might really trip up the music supervisor and you don't want to do that. Unless you want them to trip, <laughs> you know. There you go. Um, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> no. No banana peels out there. No, it's fine. <laughs> no. Um, again, thank you so much, Jennifer, and we'll be uh, seeing you soon. All right. Be well, everyone. Right. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Um, cool. So since we haven't taken a break, let's take a five minute break and then maybe we could do like 20 minutes of the one-on-ones if anyone is interested, um, and, uh, they want to step up to the stage. Cool. Sounds good. All right. I'll see you guys in about five minutes. Can you hear me now? Great. Awesome. So um, the the next 20 minutes, I wanted to have some one-on-one -on -one sessions. And this is just um, really you could bring anything to the table that you want to talk about within the music industry or to pick my experience on. And um, hopefully I could provide some valuable advice. So uh if you want to raise your hand, feel free to go for it. I hope everyone's really enjoyed this evening. I have for sure. Um, it was cool to just hear from everyone and um, to interact with Jennifer. So uh, Vernon, you are up first. You know, actually, Ryan, I did. I actually didn't raise my hand. Oh, you didn't. That's very strange. <laughs> I've been looking for that Let the evidence show. This is a raised hand right here. <laughs> um, I don't. Uh, wow. Well, I guess I can ask a question. Sure. Um, I basically, um, you know, I'm pretty much in the same, I think, boat as everyone else here, as an artist anyway. You know, we're looking for ways to get our music out there. And as you know, you know, I, I see you on LinkedIn. In fact, I interacted with you today, actually. And I think that, um, you know, as far as the best way to connect, I mean, you know, what, what do you feel? Because I, I really like LinkedIn because I feel like it's a great place for people. People are friendly. Yes. You, know, you can post what you need to post. It's more of a business platform. And I just wanted to know what you thought about that. Yeah, LinkedIn's fabulous because there's not a veil of anonymity behind it. Whereas with other platforms, you could have like a weird username. You kind of immediately see someone's background and their legitimacy because... I get a lot of Instagram DMs that might go to my other section or um, Twitter DMs, um, you know, it's just, and I just can't uh, respond to them all. So I think interfacing with someone on LinkedIn is a great way to establish a connection similar to what you did today uh, that prompted a response. And then um, the number one thing I could advocate for is referrals uh, just because um, it shows legitimacy um, usually, and, and this is what I'd recommend with referrals as well, is that you, when you do get one, um, you ask the recipient first and foremost, or whoever you are introing to say, is it okay for me to intro you directly to them? Like you need to get their approval first, just as a protocol, because a couple of times in my career, I've been excited about introducing someone and I won't ask the receiving party if it's okay for me to introduce them first. And they're like, what, what the hell dude? So, uh, that's the one thing I would suggest, but yeah, uh, it's just organic things like that. And like, of course, meeting up at mixers or other things, but, um, uh, yeah, don't get, I mean, uh, at, from, at, from an artist standpoint, I've DM'd thousands of people, uh, trying to, uh, see what they need and it's a art form in terms of uh, refining your technique to to articulate that this is why I'm reaching out and this is what I could provide do you need that at this time right now um, there there's a certain way of articulating that that takes some practice because a lot of times I'll be like do you need this music or do you want this music or here is this music and I'm like I don't even need that music you know so 
um, the first and hardest part, similar to getting into college or any job or anything is getting in. And so it's the same way with those types of relationships with, with tastemakers who, who could, uh, get your music placed. Um, but we're all doing a job behind the scenes as well. So if you don't get a response, uh, you just might have to find an alternative method of contact because everyone has their preferences. Cool. Great, thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, Flora. Hey, everyone. Um, sorry for hiding my face. I feel a little bit under the weather today. Oh, that's okay. Um, so my, I really wanted uh, to uh, maybe get your opinion on sound design elements. Like, um, I'm a composer and sound designer, and I work for a software company or the design desk, and it's basically a DAW, uh, and but mostly focused on creating audio for video, like user 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 scrolls to use us for trailers, commercials, mm -hmm. content creators. Really love us because it's really easy to use even for non audio professional. And uh, my question is, have you ever had to deal with sound design elements placement like risers, washes, pulses, boomers, drums, mm. all these sorts of uh, elements for trailers or ads? Because I noticed that this market started to really grow recently. Yeah. And as a sound designer, I'm really curious to, um, what's your opinion on that market? Yeah, well, obviously it's, it's super vital and uh, really important. I don't work on trailers uh, or those types of assets because just to let you know as a music supervisor uh, focused on film when we pair with a distributor they are the ones in charge of making the marketing materials like the trailers so that will be their domain and that's what they cover like um, for Expendables 4 they use the song Red Hot Chili Peppers uh, Can't Stop and um, uh, that was the campaign for it but that song is not in the film and I had uh, I didn't know that was being used until I saw the trailer for the first time. Mm -hmm. So those, the, it's, a, it's not even a disconnect. It's just like a different beast. Marketing a trailer, a two-minute trailer, and condensing it from a film has to lure people in and tell a narrative and a story and have a totally different soundscape than the film itself. So with that being said, um, it's a totally different department as well who does the soundscape. Um, all those effects um, and sound design, it's um, its really a different domain than what I work on. But that being said, it's uh, a really um, amazing skill set, in my opinion, and one that's underrated. Uh, I wish I had more guidance as to how to infiltrate it, but I think that everything that you've heard in, in this class and in this domain is really the same in terms of networking and knowing who the power players are in your field and how they got there and their trajectory and trying to infiltrate those circles as well and, and get on their radar and uh, showcase your skill set because uh, a lot of the composers I work with, they're fantastic at what they do, but they don't market themselves that well. So they don't have that great of a website or when it becomes their time for a director to check out their stuff, it might not be showcased that well. So I'd really advocate for you to have your reels ready, have your presentation ready. If you have an Instagram, have it all be about your sound design. I, I think even a funny technique would be adding sound design to pre-existing uh, video clips. Uh, I always, oh, uh, fun, cool. So, you know, that's, and it's really valuable. I mean, especially I, I'm a YouTube enthusiast. I've been watching YouTube since basically 2006 it started in my hometown uh the company itself and um the evolution of self-made videos and the effects that are being put in them is on the rise and i think that's even translating more to mainstream media in terms of how vital they are and how they start there and they spread organically so um i think you're you're definitely in an exciting and fun field and uh it's just about um ultimately knowing the different trailer houses that specialize in that and how they utilize those services and trying to get an apprenticeship there, internship, externship, whatever you can to, uh, to get to the next level. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Ben. Thank you. I had, uh, Marv up, up next. Hey, Ryan. Um, 
Hey. Uh, so I just have two brief questions. Uh, so during like this whole discussion, uh, I kept hearing the term disco or like the website. Disco. Mm-hmm. And that's the first time I ever heard of that. Like sure. until today. So like, what is the role? I'm looking on the website now. Like, what is the role of disco play in terms of like music supervision and like? Is it really a good idea to assign it to this? I mean, I'm guessing it is, but... Yeah, I mean, coming from your standpoint of not knowing about it, I would implore you to... Uh, they have a ton of tutorials. I'd look them up on YouTube to watch a couple of videos and to be familiarize yourself with the platform and the interface. But to give a, a brief summary of what it is, just imagine Dropbox on steroids when it comes to hosting your music, having everything displayed beautifully, being able to create a playlist that you could curate whatever order you want to create sections. So I'll, when I watch, when I break down a film, I'll have like interior basement scene, uh, this song or whatever, and then I'll have every single song under that so that they could know the songs that they could choose from as replacements for that scene. And it takes one click to send it to whatever party to listen to. And then you could send it to your music editor so they could download all the songs or stream them or cue them to picture. So not only that, but imagine a marketplace. So as a music supervisor, I don't even need to leave disco to find new songs. Uh, Licensors like Peer Music and... BMG and all these other companies are going on disco and hosting all their songs there so you could find them based on the metadata and search that you're looking for for a certain scene so not only is it becoming a mark not only is it the place for hosting songs but it's also starting to be a marketplace as well Um, so really cool platform I can't advocate for it more they're really friendly there too and they um they're, they, I think they give demos every once in a while. So uh, there's actually going to be a demo in my class by a disco um, employee as well. That's how vital I think it is in the future of, of music supervision. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that, that answers the question. I'm definitely <laughs> going to look into that, definitely. And my second one is, uh, are you still giving out your uh, email at the end to send some syncable songs? Or- yeah, I'll put it in the chat at the end. Thank you. Thanks for reminding me. I'll definitely do that. Um, cool. Let's go with Nathan. Uh, actually, my question kind of bounces off that, so that was a really good question. I was wondering, how do you kind of categorize your music as far as genres? Do you go for moods, or how do you, uh, earlier you talked about curating playlists on, internally. How do you kind of uh, approach that when you're getting music ready for a project? Yeah, I mean, I definitely assess the time period in which we're having to convey. Uh, so era is really important. Genre is super important for each spot, but it could switch from every spot. I mean, Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard was so all over the place. I, I was using like Tina Turner, Simply the Best, and then I used a Chevelle song for a car chase, and then like a Temptations-like song for another scene, and then I'm using classical while they're at the dining room table eating food so it's like it's just so uh random and all over the place and uh but i i really you know have to have an organized excel sheet that has the description of every scene that uses music um just so that i know how many spots are warranted and so that i could stay on on track and, and and have it be in periodical order as well uh uh, because as Jennifer said, organization in this industry is is so important. So that's how I kind of start the process and start breaking it down. But you, it's kind of like a mountain. You have to take it one step at a time. Um, it could be very daunting looking at it from afar, but, um, you know, one step in front of the other. And so I, I kind of start with, re- re- and that's why reels for films are breaking usually into five. It's because in order to dissect and digest a film, you have to break it down into reels. You can't just watch it in two hours every time. You'll go crazy. So you got to just focus on mastering the first reel. Then we'll get to the second reel, then the third, fourth, fifth. So that's a really helpful practice as well. For sure. And then reels are just another like term for acts? 
Pretty much, yeah, exactly. Okay. Like they're usually broken into thirty minutes, or it's usually before a scene transition. They'll cut it off so that the film's more digestible, and you could say, okay, we've locked reel one, locked reel two, you know, whatever it might be. Definitely. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Uh, Julia. Hi, hi everyone. Hey. Uh, thank you, Ryan, for hosting us. I've been following you and Jennifer separately for a while, and just jumped on the opportunity to join class. Um, Great. Thank you to everyone else for asking a lot of the questions that I wrote down. Um, one that I do have left that's maybe not the best to ask a, a college instructor um, is if you think of formal education is necessary. Um, mm. My second week of a certificate for music supervision and just diving into the material like, wow, okay. Oh, yeah. Well, um, I will say from a corporate standpoint, and because I am very familiar with so many job postings, um, I run a LinkedIn group called Music Industry Jobs, and I always try to source music postings, and I look at the qualifications. And even when I was applying for my first entry-level jobs, the requirement is usually a, B, uh, a bachelor's degree in some field. So I think it's important in that sense as a qualification standpoint. And obviously there will always be people that argue like, oh, like I have, I'm so much I, like, you know, I don't need that. Or I've met some of the most brilliant people ever in business who didn't get a formal college degree, right? So um, that being said, my first position full-time job in the music industry was at United Talent Agency. And in the mail room you get people of all different backgrounds and there was a guy in there who had two degrees from harvard uh but he was still in the mail room like right it doesn't give you any elevated status or privileges to have a master's degree or a phd when it comes to the entertainment industry it's about who you know and also how articulate you are and when you get there um but you also want to be prepared and i think that college in terms of organizations and skill sets could sometimes set you apart from those that didn't participate in that, especially if it's a skill, skilled subsect like music copyright or music supervision or whatever it might be, uh, just because you get a little bit of a leg up. So the, what you really have to focus on is not getting too much in the hole either financially. I mean, some of these institutions you're pe spending, you know, 30 K or more a year and, starting salary for a lot of assistance is in that range so it's going to take you multiple years to get out if you go in uh, that route but if it leads to an opportunity or if it's a good alumni network like usc has it might be worth it so it depends on the situation um you know you could always see how much you're learning if it's it's beneficial but uh like i said for a lot of these corporate positions it is a uh, requirement but if you're an independent contractor or independent music supervisor those qualifications aren't necessarily asked upon um, and I've never had someone ever ask for proof that I went to UCLA or my transcript or anything like that you know I could be lying like Mike Ross for all of you Suits fans out there right now but uh uh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh you thought about that <laughs> okay yeah just put a couple diplomas on your background and even on your wall you'll be fine so um but i hope you're learning a lot right now yes yeah thank you cool of course yeah anthony hey ryan hey how's it going good um so i had a question um if, if you wanted to uh pitch to music to a super, uh, music supervisor and you wanted to make sure that what you were pitching is in line with what they're working on at the moment yeah are there ways uh, to research that because i know this like imdb and stuff but that seems to only have stuff that's like post-production are there ways to know like what's actually being worked on currently so that you can be sure that you're kind of in line with what you need to be pitching yeah there's actually a section on imdb that that is in production or pre-production. And uh, that's really vital. Uh, as I said, you know, kind of seeing what they post socially as well could help give a little insight 
Uh, I always tell everyone to always follow the trades like Deadline and Variety and Hollywood Reporter because those might say when something starts filming or the talent that gets attached to it. Not many music supervisors get mentioned in those, if ever. So you really got to do your due diligence but um, in research. Uh, but yeah, like timing matters and then also knowing the project itself and if it is a fit because... It, like it could be a period piece that music that you simply you know don't cater to so um another thing that jennifer brought up is when you're introducing yourself to just put a little personalized touch in there as well to just show that you've done your research and that um you know what you're talking about and uh again if it's a disco link it's in even it's a plus one as well because um you never know. Sometimes I don't, I can't respond to an email, but I'll download the disco link just so I have it and I have the audio files, you know? So, um, that's, that's really the preferred methods that are out there. I, I wish there was another da database or something else, but there really isn't. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Hannah. Yes. Hey, Ryan. Hey. Um, can you just talk a little bit about metadata again and what you typically like look for actually in the metadata when you search and then maybe also share if you are working on something right now that you're looking for like a specific type of music for yeah so with um metadata i think one of the most important things is tagging the genre and the year or the feels behind it but as I said, with getting sent so many songs, uh, having it properly display the contact information of who to reach out to for further licensing inquiries, um, even putting the splits of the artists in there is, is really great because I might think I only have to reach out to one person, but again, it just shows the competence behind it and the intent if all that is in there. So the track being properly labeled as well. And if it comes from an album, what that album title was, just all the little fields that you could possibly imagine. And again, Disco has all those fields available. So if you have it, uh, click on info about a track and you'll realize things that you haven't been putting in forever that are, app, that are definitely uh, help stand out. You could even put lyrics in there because I think that's a great feature on Spotify, you start typing in lyrics and I discover some songs that way just off of like emotions or feelings that I'm looking for. So that's really great. And then the second part of your question is, um, I'm working on Hellboy, which is based in 1959. So I'm actually looking for vintage authentic tracks prior to that date in the fifties. And then, um, uh, I'm working on a film called Guns Up with Kevin James, and that is more of a comedy uh, thriller. So there are several needle drops throughout that are uh, at various bar scenes that I need for atmospheric music um, that are Latin-based. Uh, there are a couple scenes where I need um, more urban-based music, um, Hip hop, and then um, what else is there in that? Oh, uh, also potential end title song as well. That leaves us on like a high note, feel good type of atmosphere. Uh, yeah, so that's what I'm working on right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Uh, Diego. Hey, Ryan. Hey. Uh, combination biz dev but also like a more heavy music for a lot of people and um you know one of the things that the, the company currently doesn't really have a place is like a, a department that's like oriented specifically uh, towards sync nice so this for me has actually been really informative um and even just hearing from people asking questions and hearing their perspectives and experiences so yeah um, So I, I did do, uh, I have been doing some research and we got the label as a working on disco. So we're also using disco to kind of just like share out releases to our various industry partners. Yep. But um, one of the things that I'm kind of curious about, uh, to hear your opinion about is, 
you know, there's been sort of the mention earlier um, of like the ideal playlist size that you want to share out mm. with a sync supervisor. Mm -hmm. um, given that I'm like dealing with like a label full of uh, different artists, many of whom have like you know different types of music, um, moods, shades. Mm -hmm. I mean, are sync supervisors at all interested in um, kind of being pitched with the, the catalog from the label? Um, um, great. I know that's a lot, right? So it is a lot, and this is what I suggest you do. So uh, it's really important to go off a of precedent and what works and what other major labels are doing, and you could get on their mailing lists and see what they're doing and put it in your own words. And obviously they represent hundreds of thousands of songs, but the way that they go about doing it is by doing weekly blasts that usually go out on a Wednesday or a Thursday, and they are... Um, either with priorities or catalog music, you know, because it, it has to vary. So um, it could be themed around 70s music. It could be themed around 80s. It could be around Christmas music. Like whatever it is that your catalog could represent, um, uh, they blast out. And they also do showcase invites or show invites. So if a band is going through your market, they'll say, oh, we have tickets allotted. Does anyone want to come out to this? And it's a good way to do like a meet and greet with the band or meet them and then hear more of their music. So all these, all the big labels, indie labels are sending out these blasts weekly. Um, I would encourage you to subscribe to some. Uh, I don't know how you're going to do that. Uh, you could maybe make an alias email and say, I'm a music supervisor. Can I get on your list? just so that you see the template of it and you could familiarize yourself on what works and why they do it and what they're sending out and why they're sending it out. Um, it's important for me to always hear the priorities from certain labels and what they're sharing and what they're releasing. You know, Rolling Stones just released a new album and I was like, oh my God, I didn't even know uh, until they sent out that blast just because the market's so saturated and so much is coming out every week. So, um, you know, it all depends what you want to push and how often you want to push it, but it all starts with a really nice template and a email list that you could start to acquire and, and routinely share. And then um, that way you could also curate your disco playlists to to those emails, but also have a massive one where it has all of your songs on there as well. Um, so yeah, I hope that, that makes sense. I, I think we actually also send out um, a weekly blast of our upcoming releases uh, a week or two ahead of time. And, um, but I also have been using Disco to kind of create like sub lists based on the type of people we're sending to, whether it's radio stations or whether it's press or whether it's you know uh, 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 writers is a really quick and cool you know, metric for interviews and um, I guess it, the, the music supervisor world kind of seems like a little bit of a black, a black box for me right now because mm -hmm. I essentially like haven't really gone through the training with uh, professionals in that like, specific role right uh, it seems like everyone else I'm kind of I've had more experience with in, in different capacities and music sync just seems like it's well, I mean, it's it's foreign and the unknown is scary. And uh, so you need to really start familiarizing yourself with the heavy hitters of, of music supervisors and who routinely gets on projects. And um, again, the Guild of Music Supervisors is great for that. Maybe you could even your label could sponsor be a sponsor. That's a great way to introduce yourself to that community so that they get on your radar. You get on theirs. And uh, it just takes time to really um you know, start for the sinks to start rolling in, but it's definitely a side of the market and props to you for identifying it at that you, you need to, you know, be infiltrating. Otherwise you're just leaving money off the table. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, price. Hey, Hey. Uh, um, yeah, I, I just, um, while you were talking and, and Jennifer was talking, I, I just, jotted down some questions and I wondered if I could just kind of shoot them off to you kind of um, Rambo style 
Yeah, kind of. Sure. <laughs> From the hip. Um, <laughs> so, uh, first one I wrote down was, um, as a music supervisor, do you find you need to understand or have skills in other things like music production, music editing, and kind of in the same vein as that, um, like knowledge about music copyright law and, and, and all of that? Mm. Uh, to what extent, you know, would, would you need to familiarize yourself, you know, I'd say definitely strong on music copyright in terms of knowing the basics and the intricacies behind it, uh, knowing the terminologies and the situations that you could run into and ultimately clearing and licensing music is, uh, you know, there's certain protocols and there's, it's almost like a, a symphony and a dance to it with the publishers and the label. So, um, you know, having those skill sets and patience is really important. And then um, from a production standpoint, um, being able to provide the audio files to the correct people and sending them and uh, the correct files and the extensions that they might have is important. Um, it, being able to interface and have a basic knowledge of music terminology is important as well. So all those are, you know, easily att obtainable but take a little bit of patience in terms of learning as with any skill set but i think they're all in line and important i would advocate for all of them yeah I, I took i took one course in when i was doing my master's in uh, music copyright law and they covered some stuff on sync but um i mean i've been like putting that on all my resume and stuff as i shoot them out you know mm -hmm. But Good. um, but I imagine I I'd like to have some like real world experience with it, you know, um, which would be cool. But that's yeah, that's what I was wondering. Uh, the other question I have here is, um, would you have any books or websites or other um, other materials or tools that you would recommend kind of checking out for someone who's trying to get in into the field, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, I su I suggest two books. So the Amanda Creek Thomas book, uh, Thinking and Sync is a really good one. And then the complete guide to music publishing by Randall Wixon is a fantastic book. Uh, uh, of course the music industry Bible is by, um, Donald Passman and there it is. Uh, yeah. Uh, Julia's holding it up right there. That's the latest edition to the yellow and red. Um, they talk about sync at the very end of the book. That's how complicated sync is because you need to know foundationally everything else before you get to the complicated process of sync. Um, yeah. Or you're going to sink or swim. <laughs> that was a, oh my God, it's getting late. It's getting late. Um, so yeah, those are three books that I would 100% recommend. And then just... You know, the other thing is the Guild of Music Supervisor YouTube page has all these fantastic panels on there that you could just watch and learn from. So check out their YouTube page because they record all their Guild of Music and Media conferences. Yeah, I was curious about them, actually, because I, I you know, I keep hearing from everybody that's in the Guild of Music stuff, you know, the Guild, the Guild, the Guild. Guild. My initial impression was that you, you kind of had to get invited to be a part of it is that is that right or is that uh in order no that's not right uh in order to uh get to a certain tier and level you have to have a certain amount of credits as a music supervisor for, to be uh, like a voting member and stuff like that just like the cat uh academy of motion pictures and sciences and other things like that but or you have to be invited but uh with this you could be a friend of the guild or a student uh, i think they have student memberships and other things like that so um yeah it's not 100 percent necessary i see and and my last question for you yeah. is you, you mentioned uh, and and jennifer mentioned um organization as a big big thing yeah. um and you you kind of talking about how you have a process when, with your excel sheets yeah through um just wondered if you could expand on that a little bit more um kind of uh but from from a music supervisor standpoint, when you're trying to get organized, is it um, is it just from a standpoint of viewing like okay, scene music to scene, or are there other 
you know, other things you want to you want to be organized on. I, I imagine like schedule and other stuff like that, budget and all that. Yeah, it depends on schedule and shoot dates and other things like that. If there's on camera performances, but I think first and foremost is having the framework so it'll be the page of the script that it's mentioned, the song, the the description of the scene that's going on, right? And then you have the song title, the uh, the writers of the song, um, the uh, publishing information of the song, uh, the master owner of the song, the usage, like a background vocal, background instrumental, visual vocal, visual uh, instrumental, um, that matters, um, end title, opening title, just so that you could be aware of the budget and then the, the publishing price and then the master price. And then you could have a note section and a scene, uh, a note section as well and a shoot date. So that, that could be on your Excel grid and then it could all tally at the bottom based on the budget that you put in just so that you're organized. Um, so you would do it just all one Excel sheet. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I, but I'm old school. I don't even know if that's old school, but there, I know of, of a ton of different prod, uh, platforms that help you organize Travana tracks, and there's a bunch of others that are leading the way. Um, some of them are subscription models, but uh, Excel is not. And so, uh, you know, it's and it's. I have a small team, so it's just it's for me and it's not, uh, you know, you might have to work with others and sometimes share it, but anytime I've exported it as PDF and, you know, it's easy to comprehend and understand and look at from a bird's eye view and be like, Oh, okay. And now I understand why. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I really appreciate it. I yeah. My questions are a little bit kind of on the a beginner here. Oh no, no worries at all. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Nice meeting you. And uh, BJ, we'll go for the last question. I'll ask you to unmute. Hello? Hello. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. What's up? How's it going? Glad to be here. Ryan, thank you so much, man. Of course. I, I really enjoy you on uh, LinkedIn. There's a few things I want to tell you. Congrats on that. Um, thank you to the song with Nas X. We played the horns. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah man. That's, that's our baby. I'm an instrumentalist. So I love, you know, when uh, a great composer. I love a great musician. And um, I just think that's so cool. I appreciate yeah, it. Um, I really enjoy you, and I'm, I'm here tonight, you know, to connect with you, you know, and um, hopefully from uh, this point on, you know, we were, I'm with my go-to music. We're one stop um, out of Boston, and um, I actually know Jennifer Pike, and I was hoping I, I finally figured out how to raise my hand there to try to uh, actually say a word to her because I had, a, um, me and her had uh, had some business before where she uh, was looking for some music. I just wanted to catch up, but either way, either way, um, yeah, when you're looking for music, um, how, how likely are you to... Um, use a new resource like the company that I'm with, mm. like myself, mm -hmm. versus what you're already familiar with? Like, are you a risk? Uh, would you take that type of a chance or are you more on the cautious side when it comes to... Uh... Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, uh, there are people who are set in their ways and go to their trusted sources all the time, but new publishing companies, new libraries open up all the time, you know? So it's just about establishing that line of connection. And really it comes down to their interface and how they send music, because if it's a step backwards and it's like a Dropbox link, or it's not that organized, or maybe their search doesn't really hit the mark the first time that you're reaching out or interfacing with them, uh, you know, those are first impressions that last. And 
they might not just a hundred percent be there yet. That would be my hesitation and really like not pursuing it more. But, um, you know, I've met a ton of new libraries through events like this and through round table events, uh, that I just wasn't familiar with and they provided a lot of great tracks and we might not have been able to, to literally sync up yet on a, on a placement, but they're still on the radar and they're still in the conversation. So, um, a lot of them know, you know, and that's the other thing is like, I only work on six to seven films a year. So that's roughly going to be, you know, 60 placements. Um, if that, so it's like, it's tough sometimes to formulate relationships, but then you don't always cross the finish line because you simply don't have the demand, but there's other streamers and stuff like that who, um, obviously license thousands of songs a year. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Thanks for that. Um, just want to let you know that we definitely got um, a boutique library, very, uh, very uh, not so huge, but we have some very uh, unique music. And uh, we definitely got a lot of Latin music. We actually have one of the um, pretty big Dominican star on our roster, just in case you ever needed something Latin and um, up to par, so to speak. And um, yeah, I just want to let you know that. And any uh, aspiring music supervisors in the building today, please uh, just keep my go-to in your uh, thoughts. And uh, let's connect and stay in touch. And I'm sure I'll see you around, Ryan. I try to get around. I try to make it to LA every now, you know, whenever something's going on. And um, yeah, man, thank you. Absolutely, thank you. I'm sure we'll connect at the uh, at another networking event somewhere. Definitely, I look forward to it. You awesome. Show me some. I want to. I want to. I want to get some uh, lessons there, maybe so on that. On that. Uh, on that trumpet. On the horn. On the horn. Yeah. Okay. Well, if I come out of retirement on on giving lessons, I'll you'll be first in line. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> we got to spread the music. Hey, nice. nice connecting Thanks, with you. Brother. Thank you. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, well, we're at the three hour mark, uh, th- almost three and a half hours. Wow. So uh, this was absolutely great. Um, thank you all so much for attending. I really hope you enjoyed it. Well, like my plan is to eventually uh, maybe have this be a monthly subscription thing or something along those lines uh, where we, I could always bring in a guest, but um, I wanted to just try this out. So thanks for being part of the inaugural masterclass group. I hope you learned a lot. And um, I have a, um, let me see what else I have. I have a, uh, a newsletter as well um, that I would like to put the link into right now. Let me just pull that up so that you could all subscribe and, uh, learn about the next one. Um, and we could go from there. So, uh, thank you all for the kind messages and everything. It was fantastic. Um, I hope the stream looked good. Um, let me see what sound effects I have. Another little applause there. We made it. All right. What else do I have? Got the air that was a good one. Hold on here. Come on. Oh yeah. Okay. Here's the link. So, uh, you could subscribe to my newsletter that way as well to learn about the next master class. And then, um, there's some other links in there if you want to sign up. Uh, and of course take the class in the winter at UCLA extension. Amazing. Well, thank you all. It's been great. It's been a pleasure. Um, and I'll see you next time. Have a good one.